Thank you, Amy. We do have a quorum, and it is my understanding that we will be, um, that the governor will be here a little bit later, and uh, he will address the board and at that point. So once again, I'd like to welcome everybody to our September meeting. Um, a special welcome to our new regents, Regent Holman, Regent Nystun. Uh, very wonderful to have you at the board table. Welcome. Um, it's always a pleasure also to be here at Montana Tech, but I think it's especially exciting during the beginning of a new school year. In my opinion, there is really no place on earth like a college campus. Within seconds of setting foot on campus, any visitor can immediately sense the vibrant energy and enthusiasm of students, faculty, and staff as they fulfill their roles in educating our fellow citizens and preparing tomorrow's workforce. That is absolutely the case here at Tech, with the can-do or digger spirit that is so pervasive and felt on every square inch of this beautiful campus. But it's also the case across the Montana University system, where some 46,000 students are hard at work right now. Improving lives, strengthening communities, and building a healthy economy are transformational and powerful aspects of higher education. To all our students and faculty and staff who are pursuing and sharing precious knowledge and skill, the Board of Regents thanks you greatly and admires you tremendously. And to all Montanans, we are proud to serve you, your family, and your neighbors, regardless of where you live, and assure you that your university system is off to a great start to this new academic year. Thank you for allowing us to serve in this capacity and welcome to what will be a very full couple of days here in Butte, America. The good people who are in attendance here today and the thousands they serve on our campuses already know there is a lot going on in the Montana University system. Our business agenda for the next day and a half will reflect that activity. By the time we adjourn tomorrow afternoon, we will have covered the following. All operating budgets for the new fiscal year will come before us for action, channeling $1.5 billion worth of state, tuition, federal, and other fiscal resources toward the highest needs of our students and our state. We will receive and likely act on a policy recommendation to implement prior learning assessment, a program that will credit students for college level learning outside of the traditional college setting. Montana has received recognition and grant support in this area, especially for our potential to better serve our military veterans and other adult learners who have mastered prior knowledge in the view of faculty. We thank those task force members from throughout Montana who have worked on this important initiative. We will also consider an updated vision and mission statement for Great Falls College. A revision in an institutional mission statement is always important so that it properly reflects and guides an institution's role in serving students and the community in which it is located. We will learn about important innovations with Math Pathways, a project where a system task force has been working hard to help students graduate on time with math knowledge better tuned to their academic degrees. This is a high priority for this board and has the potential to significantly and positively impact a multitude of students in the MUS. We will receive updates on a number of workforce development initiatives in which Montana is a national leader, including healthcare, industrial education, and job readiness. Two-year colleges in Montana have built a lasting and productive partnership with Montana's businesses, business community and Governor Bullock's administration in helping to forge exciting new workforce opportunities that benefit businesses looking for qualified employees, as well as MUS students looking to enter the labor pool or enhance their skill set to find an even better job. We will also act on a number of collective bargaining settlements between the Montana University System and labor organizations that represent faculty and staff. We thank every union bargaining team member and campus bargaining team that are working hard together to secure productive outcomes. There's much more on the agenda as well. Thank you for being with us today, including those watching from across our state through Montana PBS a trusted partner of the Montana University System. We're here to move forward, so that's what we'll do now. So at this point, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Chancellor Blackader, who would like to extend a welcome on behalf of Montana Tech. Chancellor Blackader. Thank you, members of the board, Chair Tuss, President Angstrom, President Cruzado, colleagues, welcome. 
to Montana Tech. We are pleased to hoard, uh, host the Board of Regents meeting on our campus on this beautiful, butte warm day. Uh, it, at least it keeps me from dreaming about fishing for a little while uh, as I sit here. Just, uh, just as I get started here, a couple of points. Uh, I'd like to point out the exits. They're here and here. And if there was some sort of an emergency, you would head down the street on Park Street and you would assemble in front of the, the football turf. And um, in the unlikely event of an emergency, that's where you would exit through. More likely is the need, emergency or not, for a restroom, okay? And up on this floor, they are located on the west side of this hallway. And downstairs, they're located on the east side of the hallway. So uh, <clears throat> with that done, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Montana Tech. Originally chartered as the Montana State School of Mines, Montana Tech of the University of Montana has evolved into a dynamic and growing institution. Montana Tech traces its roots to the Enabling Act of 1889 that granted statehood to the people of Montana, in which the United States Congress granted 100,000 acres to establish and maintain a school of mines. In 1900, the Montana State School of Mines opened its doors, surviving and thriving through a few name changes in 115 years, we are now Montana Tech of the University of Montana, including our Highlands College and their campus, located about seven miles to the south. The mission of Montana Tech is to provide exemplary undergraduate and graduate education, workforce development, research service, building on our strong heritage of engineering, science, and technology, and blending theory and practice to meet changing societal needs and the, and the support and responsible use of natural resources. Montana Tech has four schools and colleges, the School of Mines and Engineering, the College of Letters, Sciences, and Professional Studies, Highlands College, and the Graduate School. We have program partnerships with Montana Western, Helena College, Montana State University, and the University of Montana. Within these schools and colleges, Montana Tech offers programs of distinction. For example, Montana Tech is one of only two U.S. schools that offer a B.S. degree in geophysical engineering, one of 10 that offer a B.S. in metallurgical engineering, one of 19 that offers a B.S. in mining engineering, and one of 20 that offer a B.S. in petroleum engineering. Montana Tech has the second oldest accredited environmental engineering program in the United States. These world-class offerings in resource engineering are joined today by an array of programs in other areas of engineering, the sciences, mathematics, computation, computer science, health, ecology and restoration, nursing, business, land management, and technical communication and workforce development. Tech makes a worldwide impact, as evidenced by graduates that we know of that are currently working in 49 countries outside of the United States. But Tech is making local and regional impact as well. For example, Montana Tech has graduated 506 nursing students since the program inception in 2001, and over 700 when we include the BSN completion graduates. Tech can brag as having the highest passage rate in Montana on the NCLEX exam and is excited to accept our first class of BSN nurses in January of 2016. Montana Tech offers programs at the doctoral, master's, bachelor, associate, and certificate levels to, to students that are currently from over 40 states and 20 countries. Montana Tech possesses a century-old tradition of excellence in higher education. In 2014, Montana, Montana Tech was ranked number one university, and that includes all universities, big or small, on the Social Mobility Index by CollegeNet and Payscale.com. The Social Mobility in Index is, uh, recognizes how efficiently institutions advance low-income students to gradu graduation into, quote, good careers. Quoting from the press release, the goal of the Social Mobility Index is to help refocus our higher education system away from the empty chasing of prestige and toward providing economic opportunity more broadly to our citizens. At Tech, we simply call it the ordinary to extraordinary story. And just last week, US News and World Report released the 2015 best college rankings in Montana, in which Tech is ranked number five spot for regional colleges in the West and the number one top public regional college in the West. Montana Tech is also making significant contributions through our active faculty and student researchers. Though not a complete measure of knowledge contribution, our research funding base includes local, state, and national support and from the private sector and government. Just last week, we were awarded 2.3 million grant from the Army Research Laboratory, which is the second phase, the first phase being last year at 1.16 million for materials research. 
These grants have allowed us to support nine material science doctoral students, more than 11 faculty, master's students, and undergraduates from six programs. In 2014, Marissa Padula was awarded $1.25 million from the NIH for a project entitled Bringing Research into the Classroom. This grant provides outreach support for the professional development of Montana science teachers in middle and high school classrooms. Our Institute for Educational Opportunities, directed by Amy Verlanik, was awarded $1.1 million from the Department of Education for our TRIO, Student Support Services, which is a leader in supporting services for low-income STEM majors. Dan Trudnowski and Matt Donnelly from our Electrical Engineering Department are currently working on a $660,000 grant from the Department of Energy, EPSCoR, partnering with the University of Wyoming, go Pokes, on leading edge technology for smart grid and renewable power sources. And Chris Ruse, our mining engineering faculty member and U University of Montana interdisciplinary PhD student, was awarded a $60,000 a year scholarship from the Society of Materials Engineering to pursue his doctorate. Mary McLaughlin, in October of 2014, from the Council on Undergraduate Research and the Geological Society of America, named Dr. McLaughlin the Geoscience Undergrad Research Mentor Faculty of the Year. There's only one in the country. Dr. McLaughlin is a master teacher and researcher when it comes to including undergraduates and graduate students in her research program, as well as leading Montana Tech's strong undergraduate research program. Montana Tech is also home to the Montana Bureau of Mines in Geology, the geologic and hydrogeologic research arm of the state of Montana. Under the direction of Mike Stickney, seismic activities recorded and as part of the Bureau's role in providing service to the public and a variety of constituents within the private sector, federal, state, and local governments. The Bureau is best known for develop, developing, gathering, analyzing, cataloging, and disseminating information concerning the location and development of the mineral, energy, and water resources of Montana. The Bureau is serious about their statewide mission to analyze and monitor and have activities in all 56 of Montana's counties. Of course, we're here to promote student achievement. A few examples from Tech. In February of 2015, a team of civil engineering and Highlands College students went to Reno, Nevada for the, Associate Schools, the Association of Schools of Construction Region 6 student competition and brought home a first place trophy on their ability to bid multi-million dollar projects and, reduce, and, and produce a real world bid in the heavy civil engineering category, winning out over teams from Colorado State University and Northern Arizona. Under the direction of Dr. Kumar Ganesan, Montana Tech's environmental engineering students took second place in an international environmental competition organized by the Air and Waste Management Association's Environmental Challenge, we are a STEM school, in Raleigh, North Carolina, and at the competition they were assigned a comprehensive environmental problem for engineering science, economics, and social science principles. The team beat out schools such as Michigan State, Cal State Polytechnic, Louisiana State University, and the University of Florida. In the past three years, Montana Tech has, two, has had two cold, Goldwater Scholars, Joe Mitzel and Robert Hark, and four others that were Goldwater Honorable Mention. Tech has also had two Rhodes Scholar finalists, Jack Stratton in, in 09 and Casey Clark in 2011. Kudos to these students for their accomplishments. We can also boast two Fulbright Scholars over the past year, including mathematics professor Lori Battle, a Fulbright Scholar in Taiwan, and technical communications professor Dr. Pat Munday, Fulbright Scholar to China, both in 2014-15. And Dan Trudnowski, our, department, uh, our electrical engineering department head, was awarded IEEE Fellow status. This is, for, uh, this is only for the top 1% in that field. And in February, Dr. Bev Hartline, Vice, Pre Vice Chancellor for Research and Dean of the Graduate School, was honored by being named a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. There are fewer than 20 of these in Montana. Our students are also excelling outside of the classroom and their majors. Our football team is 2-0 and with a good win last week <laughs> and ranked number 15 in the NAIA and our women's a uh, volleyball team is 12 and 4 and ranked number 20. As important, our student athletes collectively are in the top 30 in the NAIA's champions of character and in aggregate have a GPA of over 3.1, slightly higher than our student body average and have a six-year graduation rate that is higher, significantly higher than our average student body. Our football team had a 3.0 grade point average last spring and the volleyball team had a 3.4 and we had two Leroy Walker champions of characters since 2000, 
and 11. Just allow me one story. Um, we had uh, a young woman who graduated uh, again, or will graduate again this December, Mandy Mackinall, who came to us from 2011 from the Tri-Cities areas, the Tri-Cities areas to play women's basketball. It's, it's coincidental, but actually was her sister's advisor at the University of Idaho in mechanical engineering. But Mandy took only three years to complete an environmental engineering degree and used her fourth year of eligibility to pursue an MS in geochemistry and will complete that in December. This was without a redshirt year. And in addition, she was freshman of the year in 2012 and led or was in the top three in the Frontier Conference scoring all four years. Truly outstanding student athletes and students um, <clears throat> at Montana Tech. As a result of our long history of extraordinary students, faculty, and staff, we also have extraordinary <coughs> faculty, our extraordinary alumni, and friends who support us in extraordinary ways. Over the past two years, Montana Tech has received its first $1 million non-corporate pledge and gift from Gary and Janet Colstead in support of Petroleum Engineering Scholarships, our largest non-corporate one-time gift of over $700,000 from Jerry and Julie Schuyler in support of mechanical and civil engineering and nursing, a million dollars in geophysical software from Slumberjay, and in the next few months we will announce two $1 million gifts, one for an endowed chair for faculty excellence and the other in support of our Living and Learning Center. These gifts are on top of the $5 million we raised to match the state money uh, for the new NRRC building, which you've seen when you were over uh, at your retreat yesterday, with that money, that $5 million coming from ConocoPhillips, Halliburton, and Anadarko. While these gifts are, the large gifts are certainly way cool, the foundation provided a record $1.75 million in, scho dollars in scholarships that, came, that comes from a variety of endowments and many annual gifts. These gifts put alongside support from the state and in some cases student fees has allowed Montana Tech to make dramatic recent improvements in our infrastructure. Starting with the Natural Resource Building in 2010 at the far west edge of our campus, the renovation of the Health Sciences Building in 2012 where the nurses um, hang out, the updating of the MG Building right across uh, the, the street here in 2011, numerous energy conservation projects, the addition and upgrades to our recreational building, the Hyper in 2012, the privately supported Bob Green Turf in the Alumni Coliseum in 2013, the 100% privately supported construction of the University Relations Center in which you met yesterday in 2013, and of course the under construction in our RC building uh, that I mentioned previously. I could go on, but I see the hook coming out <laughs> from the wings. But I hope you get a sense for Montana Tech and the excitement we have on campus. I, I hope you will join us this evening immediately following adjournment to the Montana Tech Mineral, Mineral Museum. We'll have some hosts that will take you over that direction uh, for some light horse duvers, refreshments, exhibit viewing, including the museum's most recent edition of Boris the Bear, an eight foot tall fossil skeleton that's extinct, I think, Ice Age Cave Bear, and a short show that I guarantee you, you won't want to miss. So welcome, thank you, Chair Tuss. Welcome to Montana Tech. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Blackader, and thank you for hosting uh, the September meeting of the Board of Regents. Um, I see that one of our ex officio members has entered the room. Welcome, Governor Bullock. <laughs> He's been here the whole time. So let, it, let us move now uh, to the next agenda item, which is approval of the minutes of our conference call on July 10th of 2015. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. It's been moved. Is there any conversation from members of the board? Any conversation from, uh, from campuses or the public? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it. Uh, research announcement. Uh, chan uh, not Chancellor, excuse me. <laughs> Commissioner Christian. Just don't call me Governor. You don't need the demotion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair Tess. Uh, welcome, Governor. Thanks for being here. Um, so it's my pleasure today to give the board a, a quick update on where we're at with our Montana research initiative and also to uh, have the governor announce a few new uh, proposals or 
or awards that will be uh, funded. Um, just to refresh everyone's memory, the governor put in his executive budget last year a first of its kind $15 million state investment in research. Fortunately, our partners in the legislature agreed with Governor Bullock in a very strong bipartisan show of support and put our world-class uh, faculty researchers in the Montana University system to work for Montana with historic investments in science, technology, and candidly, the Montana economy. Our focus has been to invest in research that will solve Montana problems, create Montana jobs, and grow the Montana economy by converting university-based research into private sector growth and scientific solutions. I'd like to extend our thanks to the governor, the legislature, and also to our research advisory committee. This committee reviewed proposals after they'd been recommended by the campuses, and the campuses went through about 200 applications. So uh, great turnout there. Um, so this committee reviewed those for their worthiness of this state investment and its ability for these projects to add to our state's economy. I'd like to just take a second and introduce that committee and thank them. We had industry representatives, Lola Raska, Executive Director of the Montana Grain Growers Association, Larry Simpkins, President and CEO of Washington Companies, Ron Zook, President and CEO of Swan Valley Medical. From the legislature, we had uh, Senator Lou Jones of Conrad, and we had our very own Representative Ryan Lynch of Butte, who's here today. Ryan, thanks for being here, and thanks for your work on the committee. And uh, from the university, myself and the two presidents were also a part of the committee. So without further ado, I really would like to uh, thank our governor, who's been a tremendous supporter of education in Montana, um, and certainly carried the weight on this research initiative and made it happen for our system. So Governor, thanks for being here, and I'd like to ask you to introduce uh, our newest awards. Should just do it here, or do you want me to go back? Whatever you want, you're the governor. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh... Wow, thanks, yeah, yeah. Commissioner. Because, yeah. you know, walking into a room like this, even as the governor, it's fairly intimidating. <laughs> sort of all the heirs of academia are, to quote uh, one of your leaders, way cool. So, <laughs> but, but this is a part I, I think that, and I was uh, commenting to, I guess back to the way cool facet, I was commenting to Chairman Tuss that the technology that you have in this room, everything from the, three TV cameras, then a GoPro right in front of it's sort of like that is sort of captures the excitement of sort of this new generation piece as well. But um, look, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and I'm also honored to get to be part of introducing what our great group of folks that recognize um, not only the value of research, but also what we can be doing today to solve Montana's challenges and indeed the entire world's challenges while also making me meaningful impact on our overall economy. You know, I think uh, Montana's economy, we're strong, we're getting stronger, we have low unemployment rate, per personal income growth is growing among the fastest in the nation, more people working in the state of Montana than ever before, ranked number one in the nation for entrepreneurship, at the same time um, one of the best tax climates for business in our country. And we're seeing that growth in every single sector of the economy and certainly our research and innovation economies in that sector is thriving as well. Our high tech industries, they're growing rapidly, they're creating high demand for skilled jobs all across our economy. One of our overall collective, uh, the pillars of the Main Street Montana project, was really to encourage innovation both in traditional and in emerging industries. And I do believe that there is such great increased collaboration between the state, higher education, and private sector, and finding more ways to really increase the interconnectivity uh, between all three parties and moving ideas to market and generating economic opportunities as a result. It is, uh, the commissioner mentioned, working with higher education, private sector, and the legis legislators to get the first ever 
uh, I guess, kind of the one-of-a-kind state-funded research initiative. And the objectives of that really are to produce strategic advancements specifically for Montana economy and issues that we are grappling with in the state of Montana. Funding's going to projects that will show potential to move Montana forward as a state, meet our need to innovate in all sectors of our economy, and the goal is not only to create scientific breakthroughs, but the goal is also to create jobs right here in Montana. What we're seeing is not only then the collaboration between the private sector and academia, but also what I think in this round of um, projects really underscores too is that collaboration between various institutions within higher education. I mean, we'll. Do each of them get to speak a little bit, or just Professor Downey? Okay, great. Um, it, it is, though, as, as I look at, as one example, um, sort of as one of the grants that we're announcing today is enhancing opportunities with energy policy in Montana. And while MSU and the Energy po Research Institute might be the you know, at the center of that, it's also directly in collaboration with here at Montana Tech as well. And I think two of the four grants uh, that's being announced today are actually cross-campus grants too where incredible academics and researchers from different institutions are coming together. So I don't know if uh, th there are four different uh, grants that are being announced today. Um, I think I was going to turn over to Dr. Downey, but real briefly, um, a, one for Montana State University. There are names on these, some of these, which I could or could not even pronounce all the words, but I'll just briefly go over the, each of them. And um, one medicine reducing the impacts of inflammatory infectious diseases on animal and human health synergistic improvement in the diagnosis and treatment of mental illness, dementia, chronic pain. I reference enhancing Montana's energy resources, research and support of the state of Montana's energy policy goals and recovery of metal, metal contaminants from industrial wastewaters with magnetic nanocomposites in a novel continuous flow process system something the Commissioner of Higher Education would have thought about if he had a few more degrees. Um, <laughs> sorry, what, 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 what could I do? In total, I think about $4.5 million of incredible uh, programs. And I think first I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Jerome Downey, who's to translate that, uh, is working on a system to develop a system of remediation which is needed at hundreds of acid rock drainage sites where you can take the metals out of that acid rock drainage and potentially even commercialize it. With that, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Downey. Well, thank you very much, Governor. Um, and uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank you for implementing this excellent research initiative. I'd like to thank uh, the Commissioner and everyone involved in the decision process for their confidence in funding our research program. Uh, my research team is very excited about the program, and we're very confident that it's going to be highly productive, not only for us, but for the state of Montana as well. Uh, I'm glad that the governor got through that lengthy title, because I'm not sure that I could without stumbling. But the key things to remember about it, we're dealing with uh, low concentrations of metals in wastewater streams. And what we are doing is developing a technology that involves magnetic nanocomposite particles, ion exchange particles, and we're uh, also implementing a novel continuous flow process system to process these streams. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, acknowledge my excellent research colleagues. Uh, first of all, Dr. Ed Rosenberg at the University of Montana Chemistry and Biochemistry Department. Unfortunately, Ed had another commitment and couldn't join us this morning, so he sends his apologies. Uh, my colleague uh, in the Metallurgical and Materials Engineering Department at Montana Tech, Dr. Wong, is going to be helping uh, out with the kinetic aspects of this study. 
and then Dr. Alicia Cox, I don't know if Alicia made, there she is, thank you for coming Alicia, is also going to be a key member of our, our team on this project. Okay, so I did forget to turn on the clicker, and there it is. So I don't have time, mercifully for you, to give a lengthy lecture on ion exchange. So I'm just going to try and go ahead and hit the highlights, if I may. Uh, the first part, you know, really, a good metallurgical term is an amalgam. And what this project is, it's an amalgam of re independent research conducted by myself and Dr. Rosenberg. My contribution is the continuous flow reactor. And what you see on that photograph at right is uh, prototype two, the second generation prototype. The idea is we take these ion exchange particles, and I'll talk briefly about what ion exchange is on the next slide, but mix those with the wastewater and then send them through this reactor. And it pretty much on this prototype went from right to left. So you can see this is a pretty small system, about three feet long. So we recirculated the stream through there several times. We looked at surrogate solutions, very low initial concentrations, the silver concentration for this particular example, 15 parts per million, which is very low, and it's beyond the grasp of other competitive technologies. They just can't get to the low levels. So you can see we did very, it was very effective, about seven passes through the reactor, and we practically got to zero. 93% silver recovery, which was really remarkable considering the ion exchange particles that I used were bought over the counter. Uh, they're, they're used for medicinal applications. I bought a couple of them, tried them out. They're not optimized at all for silver or any other metals that we looked at. So the key advantage, dissolved metals are efficiently captured from dilute solutions. And also the reactor can be used to strip the metals from the magnetic particles. If we want to recover them for economic gain, we need to concentrate them by a factor of at least 1,000, probably about five or 10,000, to take it to a technology like Electro winning to recover the metals. The other thing is, it's mechanically simple, not labor intensive, not energy intensive. For those of you that have had the experience of putting in or working on a sprinkler system for the back lawn, it's not much more difficult than that. So that's a really good selling point for industrial uh, application. Okay, this slide indicates where Ed Rosenberg's research lies. Uh, we're working on independent paths, although I've known Ed for a number of years. I wasn't aware until fairly recently of some of his work in developing silica polyamine composites, or SPC. Basically, what those are are ion exchange particles. So in conventional ion exchange, you're going to have a plastic sphere, basically, and it's going to be impregnated with uh, organic molecules that are highly selective for particular metals. They'll uh, bond with the metals as the solution passes over the particles. Okay, what we plan to do for this project, we're going to impregnate, or we're going to actually, Ed's going to synthesize his SPC composite around a magnetic particle. And we're showing iron here, there's other alternatives we'll look at as well. And it's actually been done before, so, you know, we're not really pioneering new technology here. So we're really confident. Ed's got a nice history of commercialization, commercial applications. That's always good for selling a new technology to industry. So we've got a pattern of success there. Okay, as far as the objectives and scope, um, this really, in my opinion, and I don't want to sound egotistical, this isn't a matter of whether it's going to work. We already know we're going to get 93% silver with non-optimal ion exchange resin. It's how well it's going to work. So that's really what the the direction of this project is. We want to maximize the efficiency. We want to optimize. So my team and I will be working on the different facets, these different bullet points here. Here at Montana Tech, what we want to do is put together a prototype three reactor. And hopefully, that reactor then will be used as a demonstration facility for interested industrial entities uh, as, the, as we enter the second year of the project. Okay, what about the economic impacts of the proposed particle technology? Well, first of all, it does address Montana needs. There are hundreds of abandoned mine sites throughout Montana that require such attention, from very small, maybe just a, a trickle of uh, contaminated water, to 40 billion gallons. That's about 40, uh, two, two to three miles from us right now in the Berkeley pit. So this technology represents a cost-effective means for remediating these sites and also recovering the metals for profit uh, from the effluents. Uh, it's, we're gonna, we hope, if everything goes according to plan, to launch a new entrepreneurial venture, which would take the form of a Montana-based manufacturing and technical services company, 
One aspect of it would be to produce the nanoparticles, that would be Ed's technology. Another would be light manufacturing to produce these continuous flow reactors. We'd also have technical services that would go out in the field to implement and, and maintain these uh, various uh, uh, plants as we construct them. As far as job creation, the company, uh, even a startup company is going to need chemists, material scientists, design engineers, process engineers. We anticipating meeting the personnel demands by hiring science and engineering graduates from uh, the Mall Montana colleges, as well as the collaborative material science PhD program uh, that uh, Montana Tech uh, shares with the uh, University of Montana and Montana State University. And also, every resource recovery remediation site is going to require well-educated technicians for operation and maintenance, and that's where the two-year colleges contribute as well. Lastly, clean water is a global concern. It's not just relegated to these hundreds of abandoned mine sites uh, throughout Montana. Uh, it's a na national problem, and in fact, it's an, a worldwide problem. What we want to do is become an international company, an international enterprise. Montana is expected to lead the development of the national and global markets. If we can successfully demonstrate the technology on commercial scale here, um, I don't like words like limitless, but certainly the potential for growth of this particular industry would be very promising. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thanks so much, Dr. Downey. And Dr. Downey and it's, the team received about $495,000, and there's certainly as you point out, we don't have to go far from this building to recognize what incredible breakthroughs this could be. Um, next is from Montana State University, Dr. Voyich, uh, to speak about One Medicine. Dr. Voyich. Well, thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, the Board of Regents. And thank you, our presidents. And thank you, the taxpayers, for putting your faith in us to actually produce here. This is an important uh, venture for you. And you guys put yourself on the line for us and we intend to produce for you. And, and our particular proposal that we're working on, I think is very uh, near and dear to Montana. We are combining animal and human health. So that's where we get the one medicine proposal, where we combine expertise in human medicine and animal medicine. And with me today are two of the other theme leaders on this. We have Mark Judla, who's in the back, who is an, uh, uh, the department head of microbiology and immunology, and next to him is Mark Quinn, who is actually the director of the WEMU program, which is the cooperative veterinary program. And that's a big point about our proposal that we put together, is we took the expertise from the WAMI faculty myself. I'm a WAMI faculty and an associate professor in microbiology and immunology. And we took the, um, the faculty in WAMI and the faculty in WEMU and put them together to put this proposal to solve these issues of infectious diseases in animals and in humans and to also study chronic inflammation. So what are we talking about when we say infectious diseases in animals and humans? Well, some of the main, the, the main projects actually focus on some that I know people have had issues with, hospital-associated infections like Staph aureus, MRSA, huge industry problem in the public health industry, antimicrobial resistance in the U.S. is about a $35 billion problem. And we looked at this and said, antimicrobial resistance, if we can enhance our immune responses and enhance the immune responses of animals, we will drop that burden of using antibiotics. And that will have a significant impact on our health of our animals, the, the, the safety of our food, and not introducing these drugs from the animals into the human population and then having the problem when, when we go into the, into the hospitals, we get inf in, infected with antimicrobial resistance. So that's where we have this merger of the animal and human health with, with the, the one medicine proposal. Where are we going to get the return on investment? Return on investment in 18 months is a difficult task. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that it's going to be super easy. We have put in place very productive research faculty. We're research faculty that are very good at getting external funding. And what we're going to focus on is not only the traditional external funding mechanisms, but the external funding mechanisms to small, for small businesses. And in that regard, we have, uh, have placed a, a, a new, we have, we, we are, we're working with a new startup company in Montana, Totem Biosciences. 
to actually integrate what we are learning on the bench to bring it into the translational side so we can actually do some of this work that we're doing in the, at the college level, bring it into industry and create these jobs that are sustainable. And so we, have, we are working with one company only right now and it is 100% Montana based. We're keeping all the money in Montana and we're hoping to make the taxpayers prayers proud of what, they, um, what they're gonna have to um, defend to the, for in, in the next legislature to say we did this and we did this because we could create jobs and we could solve actual problems that are, that are uh, impacting our ranchers and are impacting um, our own health. And with that, if you have any questions, I will take them. And if not, I know you guys have a long day and uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Voyich, and uh, Dr. Voyich and her team received $1.5 million. I should also point out, too, that as you stated, return on investments in one and a half years. I mean, we know those folks that are involved in research certainly knows the, know the overall economic return that research can have for our state and our economy. One of the things that we've tried to do with these, though, is be able to report back to the legislature sort of what gains were made in two years. And, uh, you're dead on, Dr. Voich, that this, that's a compressed time frame for doing so, but um, I have little doubt that you'll certainly make us in the state of Montana proud with your work. We'd like to now introduce uh, Dr. Byerly, um, the director of MSU Center for Mental Health Research and Recovery. Dr. Byerly. Uh Thank you very much. I'd like to start by acknowledging appreciation to the governor and the Board of Regents for this wonderful opportunity for our new center at MSU. Uh, this is, uh, the center's been in existence since last September, the Center for Mental Health Research and Recovery. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, a faculty member who has joined me who will help me co-lead this mission, Dr. Francis Lefcourt, who's been also the interim director of the center for the past year. And also, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Stan Abel, who is the CEO of a key collaborator on our grant for uh, Site One. And then I would also like to acknowledge our Vice President for Research and Economic Development, Dr. Renee Perra, who's been critical in sh uh, shepherding uh, this new center uh, into existence. So uh, our work will uh, focus on mental health in relation to our center, and it will be a collaborative effort uh, with uh, academia, industry, and clinical health settings. Uh, additional investigators for projects, we have four total projects, include Rebecca Brooker, Aurelian, Missouri, and David Yeomans, who is now a visiting professor at MSU. I did already mention Site 1 is a key um, a biotech collaborator. We also will be collaborating with Neuralinks of Montana and Western Montana Mental Health Center at Butte will be our key clinical collaborator. I also uh, must certainly acknowledge the contribution of NAMI Montana, which has been critical for the creation of our center and also specifically for this project with contributions from Mr. Matt Kuntz. Our first two projects are uh, attempting to address a very significant shortcoming in uh, understanding of neuropsychiatric disorders currently. And that is that for many of them, we are stuck at the symptom level. So if we think about migraine or the illness of depression, we have to uh, diagnose these by symptoms like uh, pain or depressed mood. And uh, as opposed to, for instance, infectious diseases where you heard about before, where we uh, are, uh, the equivalent there would be diagnosing based on fever instead of an underlying pneumonia of a particular bacterial type. So we have a long ways to go with understanding neuropsychiatric conditions, and one of the ways we'll be making headway is identifying <coughs> objective measures, things we can measure uh, in the body, and particularly the brain, that will help us better diagnose these conditions. And we are lucky to have uh, access to a uh, key uh, tech company, Neuralinks, who is developing a new technology of combining uh, EEG electrocephalogram and f NIRS, which stands for Functional Near uh, Infrared Spectroscopy. And when you combine these two methods, it allows us to much more uh, precisely locate areas of disturbed brain function uh, 
with various conditions. Dr. Rebecca Brooker will be ap applying this new technology to uh, studies of youth um, and young adults who have major uh, depressive disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. And she will be using these technologies uh, to improve especially the diagnosis uh, uh, refinement. Next steps will allow us to apply this technology to treatment refinement. And that is, in fact, where Project 2 will start. Um, we do already have very encouraging findings from a new technology, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which uh, induces neuronal function with essentially no side effects. Uh, and it has uh, recently been shown to be effective in treating Alzheimer's disease. The challenge is that it does not help everyone. Some patients benefit, some do not. We will be using EEG NEARS to try to identify which uh, type of particular brain dysfunction uh, an individual has that might predict their likelihood of responding to treatment. So this would be a marker of those who would benefit from TMS. We currently essentially have no markers that guide us for treatment of any neuropsychiatric disorders currently. So this would be a major breakthrough. Stan Abel will be focusing on um, tremendously exciting work related to a crisis of prescription opioid addictions in the U.S. leading to 15,000 deaths a year. We know that um, uh, chronic pain is associated uh, with the abuse I mentioned, as well as depression and suicide, so this fits very well into our center's mission. And Site 1 has, is in the process of identifying very selective agents that block the uh, uh, initiation and transmission of pain signals in the body in a way that's completely separate from the opioid mechanism. Therefore, it's a way to target pain and uh, avoid the problems associated with opiate addiction and overdose and other problems. This would completely transform potentially the way that we treat pain in America. Project four will deal with an issue that is uh, certainly very much a Montana issue. It's focused on suicide reduction. Uh, on the left are figures of uh, suicide rates per 100,000. <laughs> And uh, a bit more concerning that, the, that beyond the rates increasing uh, slightly between 2004 and 2013 is that these are the highest rates in the country. Uh, the uh, blue, I'm sorry, the, the red squares highlight the uh, risk of suicide for youth. And you can see they are sa the same as the general population in Montana. And so we'll be focusing initially with youth. And what we will be doing is studying an intervention that has uh, 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 just been um, uh, proven in April to likely be the leading candidate for reducing uh, suicide. And uh, it was tested against two other what were uh, believed to be leading interventions for suicide reduction. And in fact, only Youth Aware of Mental Health, or YAM, was statistically superior to control it is clearly the leading candidate. We are lucky enough to be collaborating with the European Union's uh, uh, head of uh, suicide prevention as the only center currently in the U.S. to be working with them on collaborating for a YAM study. Uh, we hope to be leading the U.S. Uh, in this way very soon. Regarding returns on investments, we will uh, are certainly expecting immediate returns with multiple hires related to these projects, uh, including in the private sector, as you've heard about. Uh, Neuralinks, uh, with the support of uh, Success With Work, will greatly uh, expand their combination of EEG and FNIRS. Site 1 will be building out their operation in Montana, and this will be a large advance for the economy immediately. Uh, longer term, our investments should lead to better diagnosis and treatment, reducing the cost of illness. Uh, if Site 1 receives FDA approval for a compound, that likely would lead to revenues in the billions. One of the most important uh, medical uh, 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 treatment areas. And this collaboration with Site 1 and Neuralinks will likely attract other biotech companies to working at MSU. Uh, it's uh, our work in the Alzheimer's disease should expand 
uh, Western Montana Mental Health Center uh, in Butte's focus in TMS now to Alzheimer's disease, where it would probably be a regional center for that in this part of the United States. And finally, uh, we uh, hope to have success with Next Step grant funding. And of course, our mission is to solve Montana problems with Montana solutions. And I'll just uh, finish there and see if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Byron. And not that I'd ever pretend to run a Regents meeting, but maybe once all four participants have spoken, then if Regents have questions for them, if, if, if that's OK. I'm just doing a guest DJ part here, Paul. Um, and also so exciting in as much as uh, Dr. Byerly, from the perspective of, as you know, not only commercialization, but addressing suicide in Montana and some of the challenges are, frankly, from a social side, one of the more significant things that we could do. So thank you for your good work. Um, and uh, Dr. Byerly and his team, I think, received about $1.4 million. Uh, the next project's awful exciting as well in as much as um, I've said time and time again, the only certainty as we look toward our energy future is that it's going to look different than what today is. And in part, it's up to us to make sure that those differences are done by design, not by accident. So I'd now like to turn it over to uh, Dr. Spangler, the director of the Energy Research Institute at Montana State University. Dr. Spangler. Thank you. And I want to echo my thanks to the governor, uh, the legislature, the presidents, the Board of Regents, everybody involved in getting this initiative started. Um, it allows us to turn capabilities and expertise built with federal funding to look at state-specific needs. And we define those state-specific needs uh, instead of on our own. We turn to the actual state energy policy goals in the Montana Code annotated to help identify that so that we would be in concert with the legislature's thinking. Uh, oh, I should also point out that this is the Energy Research Institute at Montana State, but it's also in collaboration with Montana Tech. And one of our collaborators, Martha Apple, is sitting behind me behind the camera there, so I can't see her. And we're very glad to have her on board as part of this project. Uh, Zhao Bing Zhao is also uh, part of this project. We're focusing on both clean coal technologies and well sealing technology. Uh, wells sometimes leak and need to be remediated. If it's a large leak, you pump some men in. It's a good technology that works well. But sometimes the leaks are small cracks or separations between the metal casing of the well and the cement or the cement and the rock. And then cement is too thick to pump into that little crack. You need something that's less viscous and thinner. And uh, at Montana State, we've found a bacteria that contains a urolytic enzyme that causes calcium carbonate formation. So to put that in different language, we inject bugs into these cracks and they grow new rock to seal the leaks. Um, Don, I don't know if that qualifies as way cool or not, but. <laughs> And we've tested this in the laboratory. We've partnered with Schlumberger, Chevron, and Shell and tested this at a southern company well in Alabama. Uh, we sealed a horizontal fracture using this technology. Uh, so taking it to the field is, is pretty advanced. And then what does the state funds do for this? Well, one problem with this is those bacteria don't survive much above 60 degrees centigrade. Or Celsius. So there, that limits the depth at which you can use it, because the deeper you go, the warmer it gets. So this project will enable us to look at just using the enzyme from the bacteria or finding extremophiles that can survive at deeper depths. This is licensed to a Montana co company, Montana Emergent Technologies out of Butte. And uh, the Energy Information Agency estimates there are 1.7 five million leaky wells in the Gulf region alone. At $25,000 a well for plugging, which is an estimate from Schlumberger, uh, this is potentially a very large market. 
The other thing we did in defining state energy issues is we looked at emerging federal regulations that could affect energy within the state of Montana. And uh, one of the new rules, which is labeled up at the top of the slide, deals with uh, mitigating unlined fly ash ponds, which exist in Montana. But Southern Company also approached us because they saw our well sealing technology in their well, and they've actually gave us a little bit of seed funding that's arriving at about the same time as the state funding. Uh, we're looking at technologies to co-precipitate heavy metals out of the water that get leached into the water, solidify the pond so it's no longer a wet pond, using a technology similar to what we use in the wells, and then developing a spray technology to cap the top of that ash for dust control so it doesn't blow away, all using these mineralization technologies. Uh, we're also considering what could be done with the CO2 emissions from large sources in the state of Montana. So in the vicinity of Coal Strip, regionally around it, we're gathering data from the literature for enhanced oil recovery. If you inject CO2 into depleted oil fields, you can get approximately 10% additional recovery and store CO2. That 10% additional recovery in the state of Montana would equate to about 100 million barrels of oil uh, added to the state economy. So we're doing a regional analysis around Coal Strip that involves getting literature information from thousands of wells, developing a three-dimensional subsurface model to determine how much CO2 uptake there would be and how effective that flooding would be in uh, enhancing oil recovery, doing a network analysis between the source of the CO2 and those sinks, and then developing an interactive map that industry can use to help uh, with their initial assessment of projects. And then finally, I want to talk about capture of CO2. This is a little bit different approach. Uh, chemical capture is being researched in many parts about the country, uh, but we have a strong algal biofuels program and a strong carbon sequestration program, so we're looking to combine those, and we're looking at algal capture of CO2 um, to grow algae in coal bed methane ponds, extracting lipids and biofuels from those, and then Coal bed methane, is, most of that methane is created by microbes in the coal, digesting the coal and creating methane. That can be stimulated by adding a nutrient, which we will use a byproduct of this algal, uh, an algal extract to inject in the coal seam to get more CO2. Then we're also analyzing the fertilizer properties of those coals. That's being uh, performed by Martha Apple here at Montana Tech, and we're using remote sensing to determine total area of growth for those ponds and, uh, and water quality, and that the algae that we want to grow there is growing using remote sensing technologies. That work's being done here at Montana Tech. So I think I'm out of time. I already mentioned some of these, uh, some of these project uh, goals that we believe will meet, and I'll stop here. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Spangler, and really exciting work. It's interesting as you note that, because I think still oil production, even in Montana right now, there's actually more oil being produced each year through enhanced oil recovery than all of our other wells. And oddly enough, right now we're piping that CO2 up from Wyoming as opposed to trying to find those sources right here in Montana. Um, and Dr. Spangler and his crew received $1.2 million. And finally, Dr. Santos from University of Montana, Translational Science of Neural, at the Neural Injury Center. Dr. Santos. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. And I would like to thank uh, the governor. I would like to thank the state of Montana. And a special thanks for the Board of Regents, because the center was approved only 18 months ago. And with the approval from the Board of Regents, we were able to create uh, not only uh, part of the research that we are doing here, but our laboratories, they have already been recognized internationally <coughs> and, and nationally. So we are bringing already some of the results from this work that it's been done from the ground up. So 
Uh, I would like also to extend a special uh, thanks for our president, Bryce Engstrom, who is supporting our research, and our dean, Reed Humphrey, who was actually the founder of the Neuro uh, Injury Center. So uh, 18 months ago, where do I, hold on. So 18 months ago, Dr. Reed Humphrey uh, uh, came with the idea of providing services for some of your, our veteran students. We would like them to have a better chance to graduate and a better chance for quality of life uh, during their passage at the uh, University of Montana and afterwards to have a better chance to get better jobs. And so we started with the very simple, the very simple uh, promise that we would have clinical services, let me just get, where is the, uh, clinical services that they would be um, being offered as in terms of assessment and rehabilitation services for those students that they suffer from traumatic brain injury. Uh, in parallel to that work, uh, we started providing with this um, the, uh, happening of the center um, the possibility of developing a little bit more the translational research. So our motto at the time it was we want to act now and we want to act also to prepare the future and develop new treatments and um, diagnosis, uh, diagnostic tools that they would provide us with the ability to treat these people better. And so in order to achieve these objectives, we created the synergy between several collaborators that they would be able to develop uh, intellectual property. And so through this collaboration, we were able to assemble this year this team that is formed by several um, uh, experts on their area, including Alex Philp, myself, Alex Santos, doc, Dr. Charles Leonard, who is a neuroscientist. Cindy Laucas is our um, uh, operational office officer. Eric Guzik, Dr. Sambit Mohapatra, Dr. Sergio Bai Patel, and Thomas Rao. And so where did you go from there? Our focus at that time it was traumatic brain injury, just for you guys to have an idea about the problem. So traumatic brain, Montana is the second in nation for uh, occurrences of uh, TBI per capita. That equates to about 130,000 diagnosed uh, cases in Montana. And this affects not only their quality of life, but their quality of life of their um, families and that uh, decreases their ability to function well, to function well in terms of their, uh, in the workforce. So the cost estimated for treatment for moderate and severe TBI reaches about $50 million per year only on the state of Montana. And this is not counting those cases for mild traumatic brain injury that they're more uh, known as concussion. The problem that we faced, we did not have a, uh, tools for diagnosis and treatment for this, for, for this type of injury, for this type of um, uh, injuries to the central nervous system. So we decided that it was time for us to start funding this gap rapidly, all right? And in terms of funding this gap, we decided to act in such a way that we would provide the services, we would um, act in short term in terms of developing developing better tools for the diagnosis of mild trauma, or, uh, traumatic brain injury, and also start developing new treatments. So in this case, our focus uh, created our objectives that it was basically to address this Montana issue, all right? So we would be able, by doing that, uh, expand all the Montana biotech industry by bringing <coughs> a small business uh, into this venture, all right? And this also would create directly uh, high-tech paying jobs for those that they're gonna be graduating and working with us. So the work that we proposed for uh, this um, funding, it's related to five main projects that they are all linked together. <coughs> One, that it's to expand and support all the activity that the Neuro Injury Center is uh, doing. So this basically provides uh, all those uh, treatments that they are uh, uh, available at this time and all those um, uh, possibilities for the students uh, in the University of Montana to be assessed. Now, the Neuro Injury Center is gonna be expanding its uh, work to um, 
students, athletes, athletes, and the general community. On project, uh, pro, um, project number two, we are going to start developing com a comprehensive panel of objective tasks to the diagnosis of MTBI. So this is a multi-factor or a multi-dimensional panel that includes oculomotor, cognitive tests, optokinetic, and bloody, uh, blood-based uh, medical tests. The idea of this entire uh, project is to create the ability of assessing these patients in uh, a uh, mobile way. So we are creating a suite that we can uh, bring this to the field and use this as tools that they are reliable. We also are developing nov uh, novel therapeutic interventions that they're based on microRNAs inhibition. This uh, inhibition is going to help to reduce the brain damage after TBI. We also have two partners that they are uh, <clears throat> from the private sector that they're going to be developing novel uh, post-traumatic epilepsy diagnosis analysis program that is based on EEG signals. And Dr. Eric Guzik is going to be uh, developing uh, computer-based cognitive training that it's very similar to some, uh, it's a, a step forward to some of the uh, new technology that we use computer-based uh, training for improve the cognition of this of this uh, patients. So basically, this entire organization ties us to providing services, looking at the short term and long term in terms of development of new technology for traumatic brain injury. We have been able to already be attracting a lot of attention from uh, international um, uh, um, laboratories. We have been able to attract um, already uh, intention of uh, other sources of funding for this project in the future. So we are already collecting some of the uh, results from the work that it's already being done. Uh, again, I would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Reed Humphrey, who has been the person who founded uh, the Neuro Injury Center. I'll be available for any questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, all for your presentations. Very exciting time in the Montana University system. These, these research projects, uh, the grant, the legislative investment has created uh, a good vibe on all the campuses. Um, the support from the state is, is well recognized. Uh, just to sort of recap for everyone on the board, the, we took the investment and we asked in a call for proposals for research projects. There was about 200 across the state that came in. The campuses vetted those projects in the first go around for their research prowess and, and academic credentials. And then those that the campus found worthy for a state investment came forward to the uh, research advisory panel that I announced before. Now, what that panel looked at is how we could return an investment to the state. One of the focuses was ROI, which has been mentioned. We asked for at least a three to one return. Many of these projects will yield 10 to one, 15 to one. Um, we also asked for things like leverage and where we can attract businesses to Montana. I think that we're seeing uh, great results from that. When this is done, I, I hope that we will have brought in as much money as the state gave us, uh, if not more. And, and that's truly our hope, and I, I think we can get there. And then I think the return on the investment to the state will be substantial. Um, but it goes without saying, it was a, a large leap of faith uh, for the governor and ultimately for the legislature to do this. Uh, and I think we can make good on it. I'm very excited about the projects. So far, we have funded uh, eight projects or announced funding for eight projects, which total about $13 million, leaves us a couple million dollars to go. There, uh, just quickly, agricultural profitability, traumatic brain injury, which we just heard about, optics and photonics, water quality monitoring, metal contaminants, which we just heard about, the one medicine, diagnosis, treatment of mental illness, and enhancing Montana's energy resources. Those are the, the ones that have been uh, announced to date. Um, we have a couple more that are in the pipeline. We have tried to see that uh, the best projects get funded for the state. The good news is, is that a lot of this work will occur all over the state. Obviously, uh, uh, 
some of our institutions do more research than others in terms of the flagships, um, but we have worked in a collaborative way to try to get research out as broadly as we can to all of our campuses and ultimately funding, though, the best projects that will move our agenda forward for uh, this investment by Montana. Um, but that said, as, as I mentioned, the, 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 the spending of this grant research investment will be all across the state um, from corner to corner, literally, in egg extension and uh, different businesses around. There has been a focus on that public-private partnership opportunities when they exist. And I think all of those things together will, will ultimately make this uh, investment worthy. But that will be our challenge in, in 2017 to go back and demonstrate what we did with this money. I'm very thankful to all the researchers involved for uh, the effort that you've put forth, but also the, the conscious acknowledgement that this is an investment by the state, and we want to make good on that investment. Um, that's not always at the heart and soul of research, but it is at the heart and soul of what we're trying to do. Um, with these state dollars. So thank you all very much for uh, the time and effort that you put into it. Lastly, I would like to again just say thank you, Governor, for your support of not only this research investment, but uh, education as a whole. You make all of our jobs uh, a whole lot easier with your, your true interest in education and support of it. So thank you very much. Chair Tess. Thank you, Commissioner Christian. Um, yeah. Great presentation. So I'd like to thank everybody for traveling here and giving these presentations. And it's interesting to know what we are now investing in. And as Commissioner Christian mentioned, um, we, we will absolutely leverage these $15 million, much, much more than that. I, I know that we'll have a wonderful report to, to talk about when we approach the next session about the economic impact that, that research, university-led research has done for Montana's economy. I'm very excited about that. At this point, I would like to open it up to any questions that, that the board has uh, for any of uh, the esteemed folks that are in front of us today with regard to these particular proposals. And, and I'd like to start out, Dr. Santos, with a question for you, if you don't mind. Um, I noticed on one of your slides, and, and this is a staggering number from, from my perspective, 13%, um, I, I believe you said 13% of Montana adults suffer some, from some form of traumatic brain injury. Did, did I, first of all, did I get that correct? And, and secondly, um, is, is that a number that's higher than in other states, if you know that? I can you know, come back to the, actually, if we come there, yeah, we are going to have that this 130% of diagnosed uh, residents. Uh, we are not counting those non-diagnosed cases. So this number should be higher. So there should be higher. Actually, mostly because there are several of these uh, uh, injuries that they are considered as mild. And so mild traumatic brain injury, in several cases, they go undiagnosed. The problem with them is that not the name or the nomenclature that being used mild doesn't correlate with the severity of the cases. So you have several patients that they have a concussion, they lost their conscience for less than 30 minutes, like they were skiing or they were playing football, and later in life, they start having symptoms that they include changes in behavior, uh, addictive behavior, they start, getting, they start having uh, problems related to their balance, so that puts them in a situation where they can have a repetitive injury. So the numbers that we have in terms of traumatic brain injury nowadays, they are very conservative. And so in our case, nowadays, uh, what is being, uh, that's um, our, right down there, the hospitalization for a traumatic brain injury in Montana on the winter 2011, that was the number of people that we have at that time. But these numbers are conservative. Unfortunately. Yeah, th thank you, Dr. Santa. That just seems like a very, very large number, knowing that we've got a million people in the yes. state. Um, yeah. that, that's, that's a big number. Are, are there additional questions that regions may have? Regent Albert. Um, first of all, I'm just incredibly impressed uh, by the fact that we've been able to not only take these funds, but to invest them to address real uh, s significant Montana issues, suicide, over prescription drug overdose, um, water quality issues, um, et cetera. And, and I'm thrilled that we're coming up with solutions with generated by Montana. 
I mean, it's, it's fantastic that it'll have global implications. Knowing that these funds are essentially peanuts overall, it's a lot of, it's a great investment, it's significant. I'm curious with the, uh, the partners that you've engaged, if you're able to generate funds to help ensure the sustainability of your research and what that might look like. That's for me. Anyone? Yeah. Um, I'm going to speak for, for our group. Uh, we have already, um, because this work comes from years of testing these new technologies that we are developing right now. So we were able to bring a group of very talented people that they are located in Montana. And so once we put this together, we are being able to start capturing uh, not only the attention but further fundings for uh, satellite projects that they, they started coming. So in my case, for example, some of, this, some of this testing that we have been doing, we are also testing the ability of these markers, more specifically in my case, some markers that they are related to balance assessment as an early uh, detection for Parkinson's disease when symptoms they are not there. And so we are able to start a process where satellite projects, they're going to be able to attract their own funding. And so not only the IPs that we are developing, they're going to have value in terms of being sold, right? We are decreasing the, 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 the costs for these IPs, for these intellectual properties to be commercialized, and we are able to bring funding for satellite projects that they're not only helping with the development of the main pipeline of the main project, but also creating uh, satellite studies that they're going to be bringing funding. Does that answer your question? Additional questions? Additional questions? Regent Nystuen. I am, I'm incredibly impressed uh, with your, your work and your efforts in this area. And maybe this is more of a question for our campus leaders. So I understand we're funding a handful or two of, of projects. And there were over 200 right here, correct? Mm -hmm. Projects, 180 that were not funded. How do you continue to inspire those people that didn't get funded this time around to keep hope alive and to build some other alternatives to continue to fund their work while we're waiting on the results of these to go to the next session and hopefully double the number of projects because we've achieved such good success with this. So President Ingstrom, President Cruzado, how do you keep it all going and keep them inspired? Mr. Chair, um, Regent Nystuen, thank you so much for your question. And um, before I respond, I also want to, to say thank you to the governor and thank you to the legislature for providing us with these funds. And thank you to Commissioner Christian for putting together a mechanism and a task force that allowed all campuses to participate. I thought that was, that was incredible. You're absolutely right. Uh, when we heard about this uh, proposal, it was like we received a shot in the arm in our campuses. And uh, these faculty members um, are successful in seeking external funds. Their, their scholarship is validated, their ideas, uh, they go in front of external boards and get their grants approved, but it means something different when their, their governor, their elected officials, their neighbors convey the message of, we believe in what you're doing. So thank you so much. I also need to say thank you to our faculty because what they do it's a labor of love, really. Um, the salary is just, just compensates for a minute <laughs> fraction of the incredible time and effort and energy and passion. You heard it this morning. And in our campuses, uh, we still have many more. Actually, when we heard the news, we had 150 proposals in our campus, in Bozeman only, 150. So how do we keep that flame going? One of the things that we have been doing is these individuals work in clusters, right? They work in teams. They attract other um, scient scientists and researchers to their groups. Um, 
for a number of months now, uh, Vice President um, Rene Rejo Pera have been working with a number of outstanding faculty members trying to identify, so what are those clusters of excellence that we have at Montana State University? Can we help identify what are going to be those numbered of areas in which we are going to focus on? Sometimes these present great opportunities for collaborative interdisciplinary efforts. So think about the importance of engineering and science, but it doesn't stop there. These programs are, these problems are multifaceted. They have implications in the social sciences. They have uh, opportunities for people in the humanities and in the arts also to become involved. So one of the ways in which we do that is by creating clusters of excellence, by identifying those next areas of opportunities where we want to, to focus. And quite honestly, we use internal funds to continue that flame. So. We collect what we call, call IDCs, indirect cost recoveries, from our research grants. Those are addressed or those are given to us so that we can pay for the overhead, the facilities, the, the light, the turning of the labs that we have. But we have made a conscientious effort of taking a portion of those dollars and also reinvesting them in our faculty so that they can continue testing those ideas, preparing those, those uh, proposals and grants, consulting with peers, not only in, their, in, in our campuses, but around the nation, so that when we go out to seek external funding, our proposals are as strong as they can be. Regent Nice to members of the board, uh, I too want to say thank you to all of you as board members for identifying research as a major initiative going into the last legislative session. I think that we uh, saw in the previous years a very intense interest on your part in two-year education, and we had a conversation a couple of years ago about putting that same kind of energy into this research initiative, and you did that, the legislature did that, the governor did that, so thank you all uh, very much. I would like to just emphasize a couple of points that President Cruzado made. Um, the research uh, that goes on in the state, much of it is of a funded nature, and it's quite an industry in and of itself. Uh, as a state, we're pushing $200 million of research that goes on. What this initiative has done, I think, is brought a special focus to that research that really does aim it a little more toward economic development and jobs and quality of life here in Montana. Uh, than perhaps we were focused on before. So it adds a new dimension, if you will, to the research uh, that we do. Um, as President Cruzado said, we make a variety of uh, strategic investments in our faculty uh, to attract and retain and support uh, some of the best research faculty that, you, that, we, that we can get. Um, and we had this discussion a little bit yesterday. So let me just give you one example of a, of a recent investment that paid off at the University of Montana. We have a professor in our medicinal chemistry PhD program named Chuck Thompson, very active uh, researcher, very active grant getter over the years. In fact, uh, was one of the people who ran the EPSCoR program in some of the early days. Uh, Chuck uh, had a series of grants uh, that then uh, ran out, and so we used indirect costs from other grants to sort of bridge fund Chuck Thompson for a little bit less than a year, actually. He, in turn, then was able to write a competitive proposal, got a $3.8 million grant from the National Institutes of Health. So it's those strategic investments in people, in infrastructure, such as buildings and so on, and, and student support as well that help drive the research and, I think, keep the enthusiasm going among, among researchers. Good question. And Regent if Sheehan. I may briefly add a comment, oh. um, several of the projects you've seen presented here were actually combinations of some of those other proposals. So uh, I, I would suspect most of them are two to five proposals that were submitted. So the funding percentage is still fairly low, but not quite as low as it seems. Regent Sheehy and then Regent Holman. I noticed that most of you mentioned issues with intellectual property and commercial contracting. I think it was Dr. Byerly who has someone on his team that has a JD degree. I wondered if any of you had considered or entered into any kind of partnerships with the School of Law 
regarding those very hefty legal issues, especially the intellectual property, that seems like something that could be of benefit to both ends of this equation. We haven't, but we have a very good technology transfer um, office at Montana State University, and so we will certainly tap into that resource for um, getting all the patents in place and, and getting them properly done. But it's a good point. Regent Holman. Yeah. There's actually a little thing here that says, eat the mic. So I'm not really <laughs> sure how close I have to put this to my mouth. But um, well, actually, I just want to thank all of you and generally speaking, faculty that conduct research across the system on behalf of all the students, because these projects in particular, but really all the research that goes on, make it really, really exciting to be a student in the state of Montana. And it also makes our education very valuable when we get out of school. And I, I know that you all know that, but just on behalf of all students, it's really important. And what you're doing makes it really exciting. And it's very moving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank uh, Tyler and Janelle from, from the commissioner's office. They shepherded this thing uh, on behalf of Ochi. And uh, thank you both very, very much uh, for doing that. Um, big task. Well, Governor, uh, we're at a point where a break in our particular agenda. I'd once again like to thank all the researchers for being here. Thank you for traveling, talking about these particular projects. And once again, thank you for your leadership and advocacy for a research agenda for the state of Montana. Thank you. Um, with that, we will have a 15-minute break. Thank you. We'll now reconvene the meeting, and we're at that point. We're at that point in the agenda where we're going to turn it over. Thank you. We're at that point in the agenda where we're going to turn it over to Commissioner Christian for the commissioner's report. Commissioner? Thank you, Chair Tess. Um, so a few things to touch on. Obviously, uh, we've gotten through the research initiative, exciting uh, energizing for the MUS. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention, uh, we don't need a lot of discussion about it, but I, I do want everyone to be in the loop that we are going to form an uh, enterprise risk sort of task force. Uh, we'll reach out to some board members and visit a bit about that and some people in my office. I think it's something that as a system we've done very little of and frankly every other organization I've been part of at a high level does a whole lot of that. And, and I think it's sort of missing from what we do, where we, where we go with that and how it interacts with the board, I think will yet to be determined, but it is an Im important piece of it. I, I don't think it behooves us to talk about all the concerns of enterprise risk at this meeting, but that they're out there. And I don't think we're uh, spending enough time at a high level focused on those. So we will create a group around that and, and we'll get some input from the board and then see in the future how that group should interact with this board, what the appropriate venue for that is. Um, second item on my report, I'd like to turn to uh, MUS Long Range Building Program. And uh, quickly just start with the process. Uh, for those of you aware or not aware or need a refresher, the Long Range Building Process, uh, unbeknownst to some, isn't just the whim of the presidents to decide what they want to build and when and how. And, it is a, a very much a grassroots uh, effort that starts at the very basic departmental and campus levels as to what the needs of the system are. And this process starts almost immediately after a legislative session ends, allows those projects to sort of well up. They do come up through each side of the system. So a campus would then elevate their uh, request to the U of M and MSU sides and the presidents will work with their teams to evaluate um, what those projects are. We use some criteria in evaluating. It is one area, interestingly enough, that the board has eventually prioritized. And so the campuses work with that priority. We start with uh, um, health safety issues, code issues, compliance issues, uh, renovating space, um, 
ultimately getting to new construction projects. And that has sort of been the, the backdrop for what we do. Uh, and, and I think sort of a pledge that we made to partners in the legislature, legislature a few sessions ago, which is first of all, we'd take care of what we got and then we'll look at what our needs are. In some cases, all of those criteria get met at once. I think uh, the new building in Haver is a great example. We had health safety issues, we had code compliance issues, we had space issues. Um, but instead of expanding footage and, and leaving a, a building behind for sort of to waste, we're taking that building down, we're putting a new building up, and it will solve a whole lot of deferred maintenance issues and create new space for that program all at the same time. So that is really sort of the, the sweet spot of what we look for in projects. They range from new buildings to a new roof or a lock on the door. Uh, in some cases, uh, an elevator for ADA compliance or, I mean, it, it's all of those and it's a very encompassing process. By late this year, early next year, we will have those projects and they will all come up to uh, the commissioner's office level or an MUS level and we'll prioritize that list and ultimately uh, with, with assistance from the, the presidents, that's how the Montana Code reads on that, and then we'll bring those projects to the board in March for a first look and uh, announce sort of the proposed priority of those. The board will have a chance to comment, input, the public will have a chance to comment, and ultimately they'll come back in May to you all of 16 to approve that priority list, and then we'll work uh, through the process. We'll introduce that list to the governor's office, uh, the budget office. They have the freedom to do whatever they want to with that list. Um, ultimately, we're hopeful that they will introduce at least some part or all of our priority list into the governor's budget and then will be uh, presented to the legislature, at which time it all starts over again. They can do whatever they want with our list. Um, but I think it's, a, it's, it's an involved process that all, Actually, all steps of the way have, have respected that. The, the, the budget office, the legislature, I, I think they've looked at what our needs are and, and tried to uh, help us with those concerns. So that process has already begun. We've done some campus tours. Um, we'll continue to if you hear about it. Um, we will try to send invites. Um, local board members, well, doesn't have to be local. If you're really interested and want to travel, that's fine too, but we'll uh, try to get board members to those on-campus presentations uh, as they, they come around and, and move this process forward. Is there, do we fund any pro any capital projects, undertake capital projects outside of the Long Beach Region Group? Uh, Region Johnson, Chair Tush, yes, absolutely. I mean, in terms of we, we also seek funding for or, uh, authority only projects, which are privately funded structures. Uh, obviously, those have existed um, across the system. Uh, we've, we've used private funds. We also do some deferred maintenance. A little of it depends on scale and availability out of student fees. Um, there's uh, building use fees, that sort of thing at each campus. And in some cases, we may use those fees for uh, improvements, but they're usually more matter of fact um, than a, sort of a long term plan. And, and then I guess the, the last source is in, in some cases there's federal money available. We've often used uh, some matching state mon money to uh, highway projects, a good example, a new entrance in Bozeman and a new water main into U of M and some things that have happened through private and uh, or, or federal and uh, public partnerships. So it's been asked, and I won't spend a ton of time on it, but I think we have a list just sort of where we're at on projects underway. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a sense of, of where we're going, these projects were funded in the 2013 session. Missoula College is uh, well underway. They're in the vertical phase as we speak. Uh, Main Hall Western, the demo's been done, and they are in the process of uh, going the other direction now on, on the third phase of that. Uh, the Natural Resource Center here at Tech, you'll see a hole tomorrow at breakfast. Um, 
the holes there. They've started pouring some concrete I saw yesterday. So uh, work has begun on that. Science building and billings, we are still fundraising on that project. As you probably recall, all of these projects had a match. The legislature funded part of them and we were required to raise private funds for the other part. Automotive Center uh, building at Northern I spoke about. Uh, we are trying to do the building renovation with as little impact on students as we can. As I said, we're taking the existing structure down. So we're ready to go on that. The, the money has been raised. The plans are underway. Um, we're waiting for the right time uh, in relationship to students to take that building down and minimize the impact on, the, on those classes. Um, but that project is ready to go. Great Falls roof has been replaced under budget, I might add, which allowed us some uh, funds to go in other directions. Land acquisition, we're in the midst of that as we speak and, and are optimistic we're going to get something done there. Uh, jumping down, the, the Jabs building is completed and we had the groundbreaking ceremony May, De or yeah, groundbreaking a couple of years ago now. <laughs> The dedication in May, the ribbon cutting, the students are in, in the building as we speak. Uh, Athletic Center in Missoula has been completed and went to the dedication of that uh, within the last couple of weeks. Gilkey Center is underway, the roof is on that, so they're now doing uh, internal work, uh, has begun on that project. Um, Mansfield Library, President Ingstrom, still fundraising on that, so I thought, and the uh, Engineering building in Bozeman, you'll have an item uh, before you today on a, a parking garage uh, or tomorrow if that item uh, is approved. The, uh, the building phase of that project will start uh, in, in sometime in October. So we're well on our way on all those projects. Um, again, thank the legislature for their support in that. It did have a match, um, so clearly want to thank all the private partnerships that stepped up um, not only on the authority only where they funded those projects but on the matching side of the other ones to get these things done. Um, so optimistic about that. Uh, I, I think we're going to make good on uh, spending the money as we told the legislature that we would and uh, get those projects done as, as promised. Any questions on those? All right. A um, couple other things we want to update you on that the system has been working on, the first of which uh, interstate passport project, and ask uh, Deputy Commissioner Sec if he would say a few words about that. Thank you, Commissioner Christian, members of the board. We are working with... Uh, the offices in Boulder, Colorado at Wichi uh, regarding the uh, Interstate Passport Initiative. Uh, we have uh, submitted a proposal to be a part of a grant which, uh, if funded, will uh, add Montana to that initiative and will give us the opportunity to uh, be a part of that. Any questions on that? We should find out uh, probably in the next uh, one or two uh, weeks about the grant. As John said, a national effort to, which I think is sort of the next step in what we've accomplished with Common Course numbering and ultimately the, the Montana Corps, uh, allowing students a defined body of work that, that can transfer now not only across the Montana University system but outside the system. I think that would. Uh, be very, very beneficial to students if, if we can move this thing forward. Thank you. Questions on that one? Okay. Then uh, Ron Muffick is going to give us a little update on uh, National Summit on Collegiate Finance Wellness. Thank you, Commissioner Christian. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. As the Commissioner said, I have a brief update for you on our financial literacy efforts and uh, its relation to the National Summit on Collegiate Financial Wellness. Um, should have a handout in your packet entitled Financial Education Program. Uh, of note, this will be presented to the Education and Local Government Interim Committee next week as well. Uh, so this gives you some background on uh, 
the reasons the program was created, the overview, the building of the program, and the resources that we now have available for students. Um, as you recall, uh, in 2012, one of the three recommendations that came out of the Board of Regents Affordability Task Force was to develop a coordinated and collaborative financial literacy education program. That was in response to an increase in student, uh, average student debt and an increase in student loan uh, cohort default rates for campuses. So it, just as a reminder, in the last three years, we've established programs at all of the campuses of the MUS and at the community colleges, as well as provided grants to the tribal colleges. In the last uh, year, we've also uh, incorporated the EverFi product transit, and, and that will become a, an increased, uh, use, increasingly used tool in the next year. Uh, as far as related to the National Summit on Collegiate Financial Wellness uh, in June, uh, we, which was OCHI staff as well as project directors from the uh, University of Montana, Missoula, and MSU Bozeman, that would be Dr. Karina Beck and, and Brian Fen French, respectively, uh, we we presented at the, uh, at the summit. It was hosted by uh, Indiana University, and we presented our system-wide implementation, uh, discussed our model, and the best practices that we've developed over the last three years. It's a national conference that was attended by over 220 people, uh, 100 campuses, uh, and 43 states were represented. And as I said, we shared our best practices, uh, which includes integrating financial education into the student success um, model, and while having dedicated staff uh, and obtaining campus-wide buy-in. Uh, in addition, we've talked a, a lot, and we're getting much better at using data-driven analytics to, to determine which students could benefit the most from our services. So the bottom line, uh, really here, uh, purpose of the report is just to let you know that our financial literacy program, which I've been touting or we've been touting in-state uh, for the last couple of years, uh, is now being recognized uh, nationally as a leader, uh, not just as a system, uh, but also as, uh, as at our flagships as well. We're the only uh, system, uh, only state system that actually has a program system-wide. Indiana University's uh, attempting to do the same thing uh, for their uh, the Indiana side of their Indiana University, Purdue University systems there, uh, and Ohio State is also a leader. Uh, they've, uh, they've been very uh, involved in uh, the financial education discussion nationally and uh, are actually now reaching out to us to, to help them uh, and, and pick our brains. Uh, that ends with my report, and I'll stand for any questions. Yeah. Yes, I had a couple of questions, if I might. One. Do we have any information or data that shows recent trends with respect to uh, defaults on student loans in, in the Montana system? Do we see an increase? Is it level? What's, what's our experience? Uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Johnstone, it depends on the, the time frame you're looking at. We saw a significant increase uh, after uh, the loan program switched from the Federal Family Education Loan Program to the Federal Direct Loan Program, which was in 2010. Uh, we historically had the lowest default rate in the country when we had our guaranteed student loan program doing our, our, our default prevention. It was 1%, less than 2% typically. It bounced to 10, 11% for the university system when we switched programs. Uh, one of the other recommendations that came out of the, the Affordability Task Force was centralized default prevention services by using our infrastructure from the guaranteed student loan program, which we did on to use those services for direct loan borrowers, we saw our default rate come down. Uh, so we're back down uh, maybe 10%-ish, maybe 9.4, something like that. We expect that to, to improve uh, as well because of the economy, uh, because students are used to the changeover now uh, from the two loan programs. And then secondly, what information or uh, do we have relative to, if any, relative to the effectiveness of our uh, financial literacy program. Mr. Chair, Regent Johnstone, uh, we're looking at our analytics and what we're trying to do, do, do to determine our assessment is, is pretty what, recent. That's one of the reasons we got the EverFi product uh, was so that we would be able to determine uh, through the EverFi tracking. Every student is now required to complete transit, every new student and transfer student. And so we will have a data set as a system to be able to look at that. Um, one of the things we've seen is a leveling off of borrowing uh, for first-time freshmen as far as the percentage of students borrowing and the amount that they're borrowing over the last two years. Uh, I, I, I think I've mentioned before, I hesitate to call that a trend when we get this third year of data. If it still shows that, I think we, we have a pretty good story to tell. Thank you. Mr. Chair, um, 
hard for Ron to brag on himself too much, but this is work that the board asked us to do a few years back. And uh, Ron and his office has dug in deep to this to a point where now uh, saw, seen as national leaders asked to speak at a national conference in front of 43 other states. I, I think that is uh, a good testament to the work that's going on here. So thank you, Ron, for all you're doing in, in that area. We appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Chair, uh, I, I'm trying to listen, and we're keeping these reports as short as we can. So uh, I think I'm about done, uh, even though we're a half hour ahead of time and, and ready to turn it back. I would just like to say, though, as you mentioned in your opening comments, fall is, semester's underway. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that goes on across these campuses to get ready for that huge influx of students that shows up and uh, meet the needs of what I perceive as customers at our doorstep and uh, em embrace those uh, customers and the challenges that they present. And, there are many, uh, but they work through it, and they work through it patiently and uh, competently. And, and uh, uh, for the first time in a while, instead of complaints uh, about what we need to do better, I've, I've received uh, several um, compliments on how well the process has worked. And I, I have to tell you, anecdotally, that, that's sort of a, a change in tides. And I, and I know that that's a conscious effort on our campuses to be customer service centric and to meet the needs of those students and, and meet the demands of students on a national level and what they expect from today's higher education. And, and uh, I think they're doing a great job at that. So appreciate all the effort throughout the MUS that is being poured into student success uh, for these students uh, across the state as they re rejoin uh, the fall semester. So Mr. Chair, I believe that uh, concludes my report, again, the campus reports are listed for you, um, and that is what we have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Are there any questions of the Commissioner? Any questions from board members? Seeing none. Thank you, Commissioner, for that report. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to Regent Nystum. Um, thank you once again for agreeing to serve as chair of our two-year Committee, uh, Regent Nystum, and welcome to the board. Um, you have a vast, vast experience in the two-year community and the two-year world, and so I, I am so pleased that you graciously agreed to serve in this capacity. So, with that, I'll turn the floor. Thank over you, to you, Chairman Tuss, uh, Commissioner, and members of the Regents, and folks in the audience. I want to tell you what a distinct pleasure it is to be with you here today. I uh, would like to. He's he's gone, but. Uh, Thank the governor for his uh, appointment of me to the Montana Board of Regents. I told him it wasn't something I was looking for or seeking, uh, but it just seemed to make sense for him and for me, and so I said yes. Um, there are a number of other folks, if you'd allow me just to introduce myself and kind of a little bit about my pedigree and so forth. Um, uh, I'm the president of Glacier Bank in uh, Western Montana, 16 offices. I'm not trying to do a commercial plug here or anything like that, but uh, I've been a community banker for 40 years, uh, 20 of them up in the Flathead. I've been president of Glacier Bank for uh, uh, the better part of 11 or 12 years uh, in, in Western Montana. When I asked my boss and my board if, and, my, and my leadership team if they thought it would be okay for me to join the Montana Board of Regents before I told the governor yes, they said, you know, you've got to be all in to, to be a member of the Board of Regents. It, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of travel. It's a lot of a commitment. And I said, I'm ready, um, knowing that I've got a great team behind me supporting me. Also, I, I certainly counseled with my family or chatted with them about this opportunity. Uh, by way, by way of uh, uh, educational background, I'm a graduate of North Dakota State University in Fargo, who used to be. Yeah, I know, I know. I yeah, go crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was there. Uh, there are pictures, I'm sure, on Facebook of me wearing proudly wearing my NDSU Bison outfit, that is now for sale on eBay, if you wish, <laughs> cheap. Uh, but uh, uh, it was, it was. Uh, I was very honored to. Uh, see my alma mater come out to, and, and the University of Montana's fabulous host. But I uh, have a degree in agricultural economics. I'm an ag guy uh, from uh, Fargo. 
<coughs> and uh, was have been in community banking all along here. Uh, <coughs> I moved to Haver, Montana in 1977. And uh, with that, uh, you know, got to be on campus at Northern Montana College back then in the good old days and so forth. But uh, married my wife, Kim, uh, uh, 30, about 35 years ago. She is a product of the University of Montana School of Journalism. Her parents were graduates of 1939 School of Forestry and 1941 uh, School of Business. Uh, so we have a long history in our family of uh, University of Montana folks. Um, Kim and I have three sons. My oldest, Andy, is a product of Montana State University College of Business. He's up at Big Sky. There you go. Uh, my middle son is a uh, doctor of physical therapy in Missoula, and uh, he's uh, a proud Grizz. Uh, he's married. A wife is an industrial engineer at St. Pat's Hospital in, um, in Missoula uh, from University of San Diego. My youngest son, Carl, is a financial advisor, commonly known as a stockbroker, with my f good friend and colleague here, Bill Johnstone. Carl is a, again, comes out of MSU Bozeman and, uh, and uh, works in downtown Bozeman. So the third Saturday in November is not a pleasant place in our family because we are truly a house divided. Two cats, two grays, and an India shoe bison. But, uh, um, but back to a little bit more serious matters here. For 40 years, I've been a community banker, and my office has been on Main Street. And believe me, I, uh, I, I get the direct connection between uh, education and personal and business economic prosperity. Uh, we can see it every day. We use the uh, Montana State and University of Montana here in Montana Tech uh, to support our business endeavors all the time through your graduates, through your summer student help that comes to work for our bank and so on, and, uh, and then certainly a lot with relation to Flathead Valley Community College and so on. But there, I, I see it every day, and that's one of the reasons why for the last 13 years I've been on the board of Flathead Valley Community College. Most of that time, I'd say probably about eight or nine years as their board chair. And uh, I'll never forget when I went home to tell Kim that I'm interested in joining the Montana Board of Regents. And her first question was, well, what's Jane going to think about that? <laughs> and so uh, I said, well, uh, that's a bridge I'll have to cross with Dr. Karras. So anyhow, um, for the 13 years, it's opened up incredible amount of uh, opportunities being associated with Flathead Valley Community College uh, through the Association of Community College Trustees and in networking with our other community colleges here in the state. As I look ahead here, I, what I would like to do before we get into the agenda items today is to say this is an incredible learning experience for me, but I'm up to the challenge here. Um, I, I wouldn't have joined the board had I not had that foundational experience of FVCC. Jane and her team, so Dr. Karras, if we're so formal, uh, and her team are fabulous. They, they inspire me every day uh, to do good work uh, for uh, their students and our community. And what I'd like to do is a, a, a try to provide that level of leadership and support here at a statewide level with the Board of Regents and all of you in the room here and your colleagues. Looking ahead here are a couple things. One of the things I'd really like to do, it's been decades since I've been on some of the campuses of uh, around the, uh, the state of Montana here. And as the chair of the two-year committee, I said, really? You're going to put me as chair of the committee? And I haven't even been to a meeting. Yeah, yeah, you know all about two-year. I said, well, I know it from FECC's perspective, but I don't know it from the standpoint of the rest of the state, including some of the other campuses, uh, Dillon and Haver, and Billings and, uh, and, uh, and, and Butte. I've been on campus here a few times. But one of the things I've asked Commissioner Christian and Chairman Tuss is if it'd be okay if I look at my calendar and try to make a road trip around to a number of the campuses just to meet the campus leaders, to learn more about the programs that you offer, learn more about the community connections that you have in the community partnerships, some of your recent successes, and some of your priorities of the future. And, and being a true Scandinavian, what I'd like to submit to you is don't go to a lot of fuss. A cup of coffee is all I'd really want and just an opportunity to have a conversation. I don't know how I'm going to maybe get it all done here because of the vast geographic expanse from the Flathead Valley where I live to the uh, far eastern parts of the state here. But I would like to engage in knowing more about this as we start talking about a number of initiatives relating to two-year education here. So I'm excited to be here today. Um, uh, as I kind of 
perhaps fumble through the, the process here of being the committee chair, I will call on our trusted colleague, Deputy Commissioner Sec, to help me uh, through through some of these things here. Over the years at FECC, we clearly have, we each meeting we have a report from Deputy Commissioner Sec talking about a number of these initiatives, but I would say that a lot of the, our attention gets to be at the work at the, the local level here, but now we're, now it's on a statewide basis, and so again, I'm not an expert on math pathways and a number of these issues, but I will, I will certainly try to learn more about it, especially as it relates to if I can get out to some of the campuses and talk more specifically about this so that we're, I'm better informed and hopefully you are better informed with that. So with that, I, I, I will uh, yield to, uh, to the, to back to the agenda here just to deviate from my personal, uh, personal commentary and so forth. But uh, the first item today, we have four, is talking about the Mathways, uh, Math Pathways uh, Task Force. Uh, in your packet, the, you will see an attachment uh, from a uh, report from the September summit. Uh, I'm hearing great reports of that about the incredible number. I think there's 50 or 60 people that were together that really had an inspirational type of a day uh, that really talked about uh, you know bringing this together across the state as to how do we really provide better opportunities. So with that, may I call on Deputy uh, Commissioner Sec, there he is, to, uh, to guide us uh, through the discussion on Math Pathways. John? <coughs> Thank you, Chairman Nystoon and members of the board. I would also like to just add, uh, before uh, moving into Math Pathways, that the two-year presidents, CEOs, and deans were absolutely ecstatic about uh, your appointment as chair of the two-year committee. You have a, a long history with two-year education, not only with Flathead Valley Community College, but you were also on the leadership uh, steering committee for the College Now initiative, uh, which was part of the Lumina Foundation. So we are very thrilled and look forward to working with you. Um, <clears throat> as Chairman Nystuen uh, mentioned, uh, the Math Pathways Task Force has been at work for uh, most of the past year. In fact, about a year ago at this time, Commissioner Christian appointed the task force. And one of the things that I'd like to say by introducing it the task force has been faculty-led and administratively supported. And that's been very important to us because this has to be a faculty-led effort for it to work. We're very thankful to the work of, uh, for the work of Jim Herstein, who's a professor of math at uh, the University of Montana, who chaired the task force last year. And uh, this year, uh, the task force is being co-chaired by MSU professor of math, uh, John Lund, and Gallatin College uh, math department chair, Rich Reberger. And uh, they took over the reins on July 1 and have been working uh, throughout the summer. In fact, uh, as uh, Chairman Nystuen mentioned, uh, on Tuesday, September 8th, we had a Math Pathways Summit in Helena, and we had over 50 people attending uh, the majority were faculty from across the system, two-year, four-year, um, and to the flagships. And the purpose of that summit was for the faculty to provide some feedback on the uh, recommendations the task force has been working on over the past year. So today I'm very uh, pleased and proud to uh, call Professor Lund, who is a co-chair of the task force, and he will be joined by uh, a very familiar face to many on this board, uh, Dr. Bob Makwa, who is the uh, department chair for math at MSU. Um, Dr. Makwa joined the task force this summer and has been a very uh, instrumental part as well. So uh, Bob and John, uh, please uh, come to the front table and uh, we will uh, walk the board through uh, the uh, update on uh, math pathways. As mentioned by Commissioner Sec, the charge of the Montana Math Pathways was to increase uh, college completion rates at the various units. We started meeting in January of 2015, met through the course of the spring term, reconvened again in August in a meeting in Missoula, had the summit that had input from faculty and administrators from across the system 
in Helena two weeks ago. And the slides that I'll present or discuss this morning <coughs> represent the outcome of those meetings. Um, How do you make those go? Oh, that's what we're working on is to increase completion rates. So these are the four recommendations of what I'd like to just mention this morning or some supporting evidence that gave rise to these particular recommendations. The first two uh, occurs, they sound the same, they create alternative pathways. I'll mention more what I mean by that. Uh, if the first slide, or yeah, that one with the people. All right, this slide is addressing what I will call elementary algebra, and the orange men, or orange people on the right hand side represents what we call non-stem. If you will, you can think of STEM as tracks or, or through the university system that guide you towards an engineering or science type program. Non-STEM would be a humanities, health, or some different type of major at one of the <coughs> units. And the dramatic non-success 10% roughly of the non-STEM students in the elementary algebra, these are developmental courses, um, is rather a waste, I feel, or the committee felt, in the sense that these students, if they had alternative pathways, a different type course to take would be far better served. Um, the next slide, this is the uh, same thing, but instead of men, we have boxes but it points to something very different. The non-success rate uh, is exemplified in the orange boxes, whether we're looking at the two-year institutions or the four-year institutions, is roughly 45%. Once again, in my mind, a somewhat needless waste. And what I mean by that, a counter to this, instead, this, I'm sorry, this addresses uh, college algebra. It occurs at every unit in the system. It, it is often, a vehicle students are advised into uh, unnecessarily. They're quantitative literacy courses. This is a catch-all title that includes various math classes that discuss mathematical topics but are not dependent on algebraic or a strong algebraic background. Perfectly good mathematical concepts, just non-algebraic. The next slide Jim Hurstein, the former chair, as uh, Commissioner Seck mentioned, charged the committee with finding data that brought in the committee's mind what Jim called an aha moment. Um, the far uh, pillar here, the blue one, is to the committee one of these aha moments, so to say. If you look at that tall bar, what that represents is 60% of the students throughout the system in this six year time frame are taking college algebra as a terminal course. They don't take a follow up course. From a mathematical point of view, there is no reason whatsoever to take college algebra, the joys of factoring, whatever you think of. And, well, we have a new commissioner here that's been in banking, a quantitative literacy course that will include loan products, uh, debit cards, things that, pardon me? Statistics. Statistics, yeah, there, there's discussion of statistics pathways also. That's another alternative pathway. Uh, the last slide just localizes the previous. These are once again the college algebra students, but it is a little hard for a mathematician to fathom. The STEM majors, that's the, uh, towards an engineering track, that's very understandable, the blue piece of the pie. The general studies, undeclared major, that gets, that's a catch-all and is probably advised by default. The yellow area, the health sciences area, there presently is a task force looking for one of what we call, back to the earlier slides, an alternative pathway. If you think about, for example, nursing, I would prefer a practitioner get dosages correctly uh, for, for a patient than I would worry about 
you know, their facility with the quadratic formula. Um, I think the last slide just is the, the various members of the task force. Uh, my colleague, uh, Jim Hurstein, did a very, very good job, we felt. Uh, I don't really know where we are in time. <laughs> okay, and then um, we're going to continue this work. Uh, we'll meet again uh, next uh, week in Bozeman, reconvene the task force, and set our charge for the coming year to address implementation of various of the items we have on the recommendation list here. And I'd like to. Uh, introduce the newest member of our committee, uh, Bob Makwa, also my boss. <laughs> Thank you, John. So I just had a, a few very brief comments uh, to kind of bring us back to where we started. You know, we have this goal of 60% of Montana adults. We want to have a post-secondary uh, credential. And this is one piece of that. And so as, as engineers, as mathematicians, uh, anyone who's challenged with a large project, we break it into pieces. The math pathways is one piece of that. It's a way of, of examining barriers uh, to, to college completion for students. And as John showed the statistics, uh, we see that math can be a barrier. Uh, I, I don't like the term crisis because I, I don't feel that, that uh, we necessarily have a, a crisis at hand, but rather we have a system that's been in place for, for many decades that we're trying to, to update to, to be more reflective of the requirements that our students, both the technological students, the STEM students, as well as the non-STEM students, what, what needs will they face as they enter a, you know, a technologically based uh, um, economy and, and, and workforce. Uh, we're talking about some major tra uh, transformational changes. You know, at, at, as we sit here today, there's, there's 12 to 14,000 students across the state taking math courses. Uh, so we have a large end value. You know, the numbers that, that John showed uh, uh, are, are, are significant. And so to make changes, when we're talking about large numbers of students, we have to be very, very deliberate and very calculated. And, and, and it takes strong leadership. And I, I do want to, again, thank uh, the commissioner's office uh, Deputy Commissioner John Seck, as well as uh, before him, Neil Moisey, and the leadership they've provided, uh, Jim Herstein, uh, John Lund, and Rich Reberger, who could not be here today from Gallon College as, as well. Uh, there's a lot of other things that are, that are in the works in addition to math pathways. There's other task force that are currently underway at the, at the system level, looking at uh, math assessments, how we assess where a student should be when they enter their first math course, what's the best math course for them to start in, uh, as well as this picture of which pathway would, would be the right pathway for their major. Uh, there's a developmental task force looking at developmental education in the math area, um, and, and, and so on. In addition, our campuses are all undertaking uh, different initiatives to help improve what we're seeing with math. You know, at the University of Montana, they have uh, things like math emporiums, uh, peer mentoring. At, at Montana State, we have similar things, uh, uh, the Math Learning Center. You know, an interesting statistic from, from the Math Learning Center, where students who are taking math courses could come and get one-on-one -on -one help from instructors, from PhD math students, uh, from professors. Uh, the tenth day of class we had, at the end of the tenth day of class this semester, we had over 3,000 students who had visited the Math Learning Center to get one-on-one -on -one help. Uh, we have initiated a, a new system of what we call student success coordinators. Some of our math courses have over 1,000 students, and those courses are broken into 15 to 20 separate sections. And we felt a strong need that, that those sections needed to be coordinated they need to be, have some oversight for quality control and those kinds of things. With the data, and we love looking at data, but the data from when those student success coordinators started shows success rates have increased from 10 to 20 percent. Uh, so, so my point is that we're doing a lot already, and all of our campuses are doing a lot to, to help this math issue and to move the ball forward. This task force has been very beneficial because it brings all of our campus representatives together. Two-year, four-year, 
uh, the four-year colleges, the, the flagships, and, and so, so we're, we're, we're making great progress. Uh, in, cl in closing, we have a few tasks ahead of us. So the recommendations that Dr. Lund presented are what came out of this last year of, of, of meetings and reviewing literature and seeing what others are doing, as well as the math statewide summit that happened. Uh, but there's still important tasks to, ahead of us. One is action. How are we going to take those recommendations and, and move them into action items? Uh, and two, how will they be implemented? And, and so those are, those are very important pieces. Uh, and then with implementation, we want to look at assessment. And then we can recalibrate as needed and move forward. Uh, so with that being said, I, I, will, I will turn the, the, the microphone uh, back over to Chair Nystrom. And we appreciate this opportunity to come and talk to you today. Thank you. Bob, John. John, other commentary before we open up for some questions and comments? Okay. Uh, questions, comments from the regents? Uh, 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 yeah, Regent Albrecht. <laughs> Chair Nice turn. Uh, could you, this is exciting for overall retention and outcomes, and, and I am thrilled. The research is there, it supports it, and for us to implement it into our system is fantastic. So thank you for your work. What are we looking at for timeline? for implementation of, of these tasks moving forward. Is this a two-year plan? Is this a, what's the plan? For this coming year, the implementation. Yes, ma'am. Regent Albrecht, um, just to expand on that, uh, the task force will be presenting its full recommendations to the Board of Regents at its May meeting. Regent Tuss. Thank you, Chair. Nice to um, I really want to thank you guys for doing this. Um, there, there are those times when we talk a lot about a lot of things at this board table that are important to us, and we wonder, OK, what's the next step? How do we implement? This is a priority for this board and has been for some time. We told the commissioner's office this is a priority for this board. Um, seeing you in front of us today with, with what you're doing, I couldn't be more pleased. So more than anything, thank you. Thank, thank the members of this task force. Um, this is really important, really, really important. So, so keep the foot on the gas on this particular issue. I, I don't know that I heard, maybe I just didn't, didn't understand. Um, I, I didn't hear the word co-requisite math come out. Um, I, I know that in terms of an agenda item for Complete College America and Complete College Montana, that, that's, one of, that's one of the areas that we talk a lot about. Um, is that kind of the direction that we're going? If, if developmental math is not working, which it doesn't seem to be here or anywhere, the co-requisite model seems to be where, where things may be headed. Is, is that where this is going? Um, uh, Regent Tuss, thank you for, the, for that question. Uh, there is an element to co-requisite, but that's bigger than this task force, and I, I, I would like to turn the mic over to Deputy Commissioner Seck, and I think he could add some more to that, that uh, initiative. Chairman Tuss, uh, members of the board, uh, we are a part of a, a grant application that was submitted to Complete College America uh, for assistance with uh, developing uh, co-requisite models, which we, I might say, we already have happening in diff on different campuses uh, in the state. Um, we should hear from uh, Complete College America in the next few weeks uh, uh, with an answer on, on the application that was submitted. Um, we did have uh, uh, all of our higher education institutions, with the exception of two, uh, who agreed to be a part of it. Um, if, if that's happening. And, and I think as uh, uh, Dr. Makwa mentioned a moment ago, we have a lot of innovation happening on campuses at the department level and at the campus level. And I think what things like this task force are looking at and the grant is looking at is how do we scale those innovations across the system? And, and so this would give us the resources to, to help do that. Other questions or comments? President Cruzado. Yeah. Chairman Nystrom and um, members of the board, trying to tie this, this morning we were having a very important conversation with faculty leaders about retention. And we were identifying some of the best practices in terms of 
you know, more involvement with students and faculty will always result in, st in students choosing to stay in, in college. We talked about the importance of financial aid um, and how, for the most part, when a student abandons school, doesn't have to do, for the majority of the, of the cases, it doesn't have to do with academics. When we focus on math, this is exactly the key that will open the door to student retention in all our campuses. I like to say that not every student that fails math will abandon college, but almost every student that has abandoned college has failed math, sometimes more than once. So by us paying attention to this math requisite, it will do extraordinary things for not only student retention, it will accelerate graduation rates. And lastly, and perhaps most, most importantly, we will have better prepared professionals and citizens who will be lead better lives because they will have the tools to understand many important things in life. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Mr. Chair, um, I believe uh, Dean Shannon O'Brien would like to address the board. Hello, Dean. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you, uh, Chair Nystoon and uh, Regent Tuss, just to address your um, question about the co-requisite. At Missoula College, we are implementing a pilot group this semester of, um, we're calling it a sequential co-requisite. This was the idea of um, our, one of our professors, uh, Joe Crapo, of having one, uh, the students are registering for uh, th those that placed, uh, one small group that placed into a pre-college math are registering for both uh, 90, math 90, as well as a math 15 with an intensive five week of the, of the 90 course. And then if they're successful there, then they move on to a 10 week of the math 115. And this was the idea that came from um, this professor. So we're um, rolling out that co-requisite concept just in a, in a slightly different way than I had learned with the Complete College America and Complete College Montana model. Other questions and comments? Thank you again, gentlemen, for your, your presentation this morning. Game on. Let's get going. Way to thank you. Okay. Uh, it's now time to uh, the next item of business is the Montana Department of Labor and Montana University System Partnership to foster new workforce development and apprenticeship opportunities. Deputy Commissioner Sec. Thank you, Chairman Nystoon, members of the board. Um, as you recall, uh, Last March at this meeting, uh, you received a report from Montana Department of Labor and Industry Commissioner Pam Busey about the many partnerships which are occurring between the Montana University System and the Montana Department of Labor and Industry, and many of them you're aware of. Uh, the TAC-3 grant, which is Rev Up, you'll hear about that in a few moments. The TAC-4 grant, Healthcare Montana, you'll hear about that the Big Sky Pathways program, and there are many others. Um, this summer, uh, Commissioner Christian and Commissioner Busey worked together to do something truly different, to create a new position that's a joint position between the Montana Department of Labor and Industry and the Montana University System with the support of funds from the Rev Up grant to really bridge, to, to bring the two agencies even closer together, especially as it relates to industry partnerships and workforce development. And we're very pleased that uh, Dr. Kirk Lacey was hired uh, to serve in this position. And his title is the Director of Industry-Driven Workforce Development Partnerships. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Lacey. Well, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Chairman Tuss and members of the board, uh, I'm very honored to be able to serve in this new role. Uh, it's a very exciting and innovative new role, as uh, Deputy Commissioner Sec just uh, mentioned, um, that uh, uh, it's a very vital time to be involved in workforce development initiatives for the state of Montana. And I want to thank the uh, uh, Commissioner 
Christian and Deputy Commissioner Seck and Commissioner Pam Busey from the Department of Labor and Industry for having the vision and the leadership to initiate this uh, new position to foster new partnerships uh, for serving Montana's uh, workforce development needs. The position is dedicated uh, to serving two priority goals under the broad umbrella of aligning Montana's education and workforce development systems to promote uh, more uh, uh, specific alignment goals and partnership goals among uh, the state's workforce uh, uh, stakeholders. With last month's kickoff of the uh, implementation of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, uh, the state of Montana was actually, is actually the first state to begin implementation of the guidelines uh, and regulations under the new Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And what is obvious about uh, the challenges that the act presents uh, and that, uh, that the uh, challenges that the, for workforce development in the state of Montana present with, uh, for us is that there are an amazing array of stakeholders involved in workforce development throughout the state of Montana. And the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act partners, Montana Department of Labor and Industry, the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Education, the Montana University System, Adult Basic Education, the job services throughout Montana, TANF, Vocational Rehabilitation, Office of Public Instruction, Registered Apprenticeship Programs. You have a, an amazing array of programs, services, resources, and, and, and human resources that are dedicated to serving Montana's workforce development needs. And what ultimately is needed is to um, promote alignment and partnership and collaboration uh, amongst these different uh, programs and services to, to more effectively serve the state's workforce uh, needs and, and challenges. So alignment goals is the first major objective to promote uh, better and improved integration, collaboration, um, and alignment of these programs and services throughout the state. And ultimately partnership goals to cultivate new opportunities for uh, education, government, and economic development entities throughout uh, the state and in local communities uh, to work together to team up and braid the resources that they have, the programs that they have to more effectively serve the state's workforce challenges. And so the symbolism that you're seeing in the slide with uh, the zipper is, uh, I have to credit uh, Matt Springer from the Rev Up Grant initiative with that symbolism, but it really is a, a great symbolism to describe the spirit and the intent of this new position to expand the zipper by taking a set of interlocking parts together and uh, build a strong bond through alignment and partnership to serve our state's workforce needs and challenges. As I've been traveling the state over the past uh, few months meeting with uh, colleges, uh, leadership in the um, job services, Department of Labor programs, and the um, economic development entities throughout Montana, there are five major priority areas of focus that have surfaced as uh, as the areas where uh, we've, we're proposing to focus our time, energy, and resources this coming year uh, uh, through this new position. The first area is data alignment. Um, to leverage the power of the data that we have uh, through the uh, Montana University System, uh, the Commissioner's Office, and the data that at the Department of Labor and Industry, to align that data together to, get, to allow uh, each college at the academic program level to have a better uh, a profile of the data trends um, for the talent development pipeline for each academic program that, uh, that each college is offering to serve Montana's workforce uh, development needs. So if you think of the talent de development pipeline and looking at the data trends of uh, the students that are entering into the academic programs, uh, the, the characteristics of students as they're progressing through the academic programs and the trends in terms of the outputs as individuals are, are exiting the academic programs and going out into the workforce. And then most importantly, being able to do the gap analysis, to line that data up against the um, uh, workforce and employment uh, projections and the needs analysis uh, for the workforce needs in the next five to 10 years and see how our academic programs are individually lining up uh, with those projected needs and those forecasts so we can make uh, better and, and more effective uh, strategic planning and um, program uh, decision making uh, to align our data and our programs uh, to serve uh, the, the current and future workforce needs. The second major project is focusing on integrating new apprenticeships and work-based learning opportunities uh, with college programs. 
Uh, we have examples through MSU Northern and, and Helena College that uh, where uh, some of the colleges uh, uh, have examples where they've already pioneered some of those efforts. But there's so much more opportunity for us to integrate apprenticeships and, and work-based learning opportunities with college programs. Historically, apprenticeships and college programs have been divergent career pathways. And it doesn't need to be that way. And so we want to cultivate new opportunities uh, across uh, various um, academic program areas and occupation areas, work with employer sponsors, and, uh, and integrate uh, college programs and apprenticeship and work-based learning opportunities more effectively together. The third priority area of focus is to align efforts with the university system and Department of Labor outreach specialists uh, to serve the post-employment training needs of industry and employers. Um, at every college, uh, there are professionals that are dedicated to doing outreach to employers and industry for workforce development, customized training, and these types of, of uh, programs and services. At every one of the 23 job services throughout the state, there are uh, workforce specialists and professionals that are dedicated uh, to a similar uh, set of responsibilities. There are similar professionals at adult basic education centers. There are similar professionals with Carl Perkins Technical Education uh, Pathways programs. What we want to do is, as often as possible, bring those specialists together as a team and to do common and joint outreach to serve their local uh, uh, employer uh, training needs. The fourth area is uh, taking a new look at employer-based uh, training programs and union-based training programs and uh, providing an opportunity to have those programs evaluated for, for college-level credit and to uh, have those uh, programs that, uh, that are able to be awarded uh, or approved for college-level credit become new career uh, pathways uh, into college programs and uh, allow individuals to be able to um, progress um, into higher levels of, of uh, education uh, uh, through their uh, employer and union-based training programs. The fifth is focusing on uh, cultivating uh, community partnerships and pilot projects at the local level. Through sector-based uh, strategy partnerships and community partnerships, working with the various WIOA um, uh, stakeholder groups throughout the communities, uh, economic development councils, and industry employer sponsors to focus and zero in on priority workforce needs at the local level and to channel program services and resources to serve those needs. I'm very excited to be in this new role. I thank the commissioner and the deputy commissioner and Commissioner Busey for, for uh, creating the role and, to, and for their faith in me to provide leadership in pursuing these important goals as well as others uh, that will uh, be added uh, as we move forward. Uh, I look forward to working with all of you and the stakeholders throughout the university system and the Department of Labor and other we all partners throughout the state uh, to successfully serve the state's workforce development needs. I'm happy to answer any questions. Doc, uh, Deputy Commissioner Seck, do you have any comments to add to Dr. Lacey's presentation? Nope. Okay. How about questions, comments for Dr. Lacey? Uh, Regent Johnstone. Thank you. Regent. Uh, Dr. Lacey, uh, I was involved in the uh, Main Street Montana project, and, and clearly the, the most the constant, consistent comment that we received when we went out and talked to businesses in the state was the need for workforce development and an alignment of workforce development with the need, the real needs of the economy. So I'm pleased that you're taking this on. <clears throat> um, two, two or three observations. One, uh, what we saw and what I am concerned about is the fragmentation of how we're approaching this at a, or how we've historically approached it at a state level. And I would hope that uh, through your efforts and the efforts of the folks that are working with you, we can take, uh, develop a more integrated approach to this because there's a myriad of programs out there that are devoted to improving workforce development. But I fear that, it, that oftentimes that they're so fragmented that we're not getting the sort of return that we need. So I would hope there'd be a real focus on developing a real integrated approach. I know there are a lot of distinct governmental programs I know there are a lot of distinct players and partners in this, and uh, the challenge will be to bring those together and do it on an integrated basis. And, and secondly, um, and, and if, if you look at European countries who I think do this pretty effectively, 
I think one of the things you learn from them is that they do it on a more centralized, integrated basis. And um, the second point is, I would hope that we wouldn't forget the role of high schools in all of this. I think at times we think about workforce development starting post K through 12. And I think the realities of, of the world are that there are a lot of uh, students that could benefit from this uh, at a much earlier level, yes. earlier stage of educational career. So I take it that there's some involvement of K through 12 education. So. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Regent Chi. I do have an observation and a question. My observation is that um, while you credited Matt Springer with this design, it seems eerily similar to the Sticky Fingers Rolling Stones album cover of about 1973, which I found a little alarming. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my question had to do with bills, which is, um, is this a direct outgrowth out of the mainstream Montana pillars? It seems to be directly related. And what coordination have we had with the governor's office and the mainstream Montana commission? Yeah, very good question. It's, it's directly aligned with pillar one of the uh, mainstream Montana project. Uh, I've been actively involved in attending uh, various kin meetings, uh, key industry network meetings uh, since I uh, started the, the uh, position. Um, the governor's office and uh, the Main Street Montana uh, project um, uh, officials have been um, very directly engaged in, in uh, including us and um, bringing us into those uh, discussions so that we can both be listening to the employers and understanding uh, the, the, the needs and the issues and challenges that uh, are surfacing through those kin meetings, but also to then brainstorm and, and cultivate opportunities for collaboration, alignment, partnership that um, are beginning to percolate as a result of those, those conversations. Um, similar to um, one of your points, the uh, uh, last month the state officially kicked off the first uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act uh, uh, summit. And I believe it was the first time where um, all of the major uh, uh, WIOA partners actually convened together rather than having separate meetings. And it, it's a huge um, example of the convergence and the integration and alignment that's, that's coming together. Um, I had great dialogue amongst those stakeholders about ways to move forward with projects for collaboration uh, at, the, at, the at the community and the regional levels. Um, tomorrow, there's a state workforce investment board meeting uh, that uh, is kicking off another layer of that dialogue, uh, which involves uh, uh, those individuals appointed through the governor's office uh, to map out a strategy for the state workforce innovation board uh, activities for the coming year, and that's all directly aligned. Um, and uh, we also then next week on Thursday, Friday, are having a, a two-day planning session to begin the process of developing the state uh, workforce plan, uh, which is a, also a part of the um, uh, the WIOA um, guidelines. And so uh, the governor's office, the commissioner's office, Department of Labor and Industry, uh, Department of Commerce, um, uh, Office of Public Instruction at the K-12 level, Adult Basic Ed, Vocational Rehab, all of these various partners are joining forces and, and are, are truly uh, embracing the opportunity to collaborate together. May I follow up? Sure. Is there momentum to keep those stakeholders with you at the table? Do you feel like the momentum it will continue with all of these various entities being represented? Well, I know, I know much, of, much of the momentum had begun before I started the position just two months ago, but I've been thrilled. Uh, I've been actively uh, out throughout the state uh, pretty much every day over the, la over the past two months uh, meeting with these different stakeholder groups, and I'm thrilled with, uh, with everyone's uh, sincere, as I said, embracing of, of okay. the need and the opportunity to, uh, to collaborate uh, to serve these priority goals and needs. So I'm, I'm excited and, and, uh, and I, I couldn't be happier with the reception that, that this is all getting uh, across the different agencies. Deputy Commissioner Sack. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, would like to uh, just add a few thoughts uh, with respect to uh, Regent Sheehy's uh, question. <clears throat> I think what we're doing in Montana is, is leading the way possibly for most of the states in the country as far as the, the connectivity and partnership between the higher education units, the State Department of Labor and Industry, 
the Office of Public Instruction and Industry all coming together. Um, the Governor's Office, Main Street, Montana is a big piece of that as well. Um, <clears throat> the two major grants that we're going to discuss in just a few moments, Healthcare Montana and Rev Up, would not, I believe, be happening without that sort of partnership, the connectivity that we have had with those agencies and with business and industry. And what's interesting, the commissioner sent me to uh, a uh, NASH meeting in California earlier uh, in August, uh, National Association of System Heads. And this was one of the topics that, that we discussed. And I, and I spent a fair bit of time talking about what we're doing in, in Montana. And there was great interest because many states are very fragmented and don't have this sort of connectivity. Uh, and, and frankly, they don't have this sort of connectivity between the two-year and the four-year sectors, which we enjoy in Montana. Um, so I think it's, it's pretty darn exciting, and, and um, we look forward to future opportunities to update this board on the, the great work that's happening and, and that Dr. Lacey, I believe, is going to help us further advance. Regent Sheehy. I just wanted to emphasize that when we got the Main Street Montana report, Bill's group, we as a board, I think, took that as a charge, that we had uh, an activity associated with Main Street Montana. And I'm very pleased to hear this report. I'm very pleased to hear that we're in a collaborative effort and that Main Street Montana is not just a pretty booklet that's been put on a shelf. I think it's really important that we continue that work and that we continue to believe that that is our charge as a board and I hope that the other board members feel the same way. Thank you. Any final comments for Regent Albert? Uh, Chair Nystuen, uh, just a clarification. I I'm curious if, uh, and maybe uh, Deputy Commissioner Sack, you can answer this as well. Would you say from a business perspective that the, the biggest challenge or barrier with them developing an apprenticeship program is financial or is it human capital? Why would a business say, you know, I just can't, just can't do it. And how are we solving that? <clears throat> Candidly, uh, in the short time that I've been involved in, in the position and, and the discussions that I've been able to, to have with employers about apprenticeships, um, is that there's a real lack of understanding of what an apprenticeship is, how it's different from, say, internships or other work-based learning opportunities. Um, and there's a lack of understanding of what an apprenticeship is, what it takes to get one set up. Um, and so it's really an education process to, to, to sit down with employers and understand what their specific needs are, what workforce challenges are they trying to, uh, to address, and then uh, if an apprenticeship uh, model can serve that need, it's being able to introduce that and showing that it's, it's, it's not that difficult. Uh, it is something that has significant advantages uh, for, for the employer and the apprentice. Um, and it, but it's, it's really a, a lack of understanding, uh, a lack of uh, knowledge about, about what it is and how it can work. Commissioner. Chair Nice Tune, Region Albrecht. Just to add to that, I, I think that's spot on. I think it's cultural more than anything. And, and having crossed the state at a few of the kin meetings myself, it, it's sort of ironic because a number of businesses say what we're really lacking is internships or apprenticeships or by whatever name we want to call them, but we We've just not done that, and, and we've really not done that when you compare it to how well it's worked in other countries and other cultures. It's just something that's never really been embedded in, in, in the business community, and yet there's the need and the outreach. I, I don't think we're going to face tremendous obstacles on either of those fronts, financial or, or the human capital side, if, if we can come forward with a, a good program that ultimately serves the need to not only educate the students, but also create that work environment that, that really takes them to the next step. That sort of moving from the book to the, to the job, I, I think we can bridge that, and, and uh, I think this is a great step in the right direction. I'd like to thank uh, Kurt for taking this position. Deputy Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner, Commissioner Busey and I um, had the pleasure to interview in Billings, and we left the meeting saying, this is the guy that can do this for us, that can bridge Main Street, Montana, Department of Commerce, Department of Labor, and our office to, to work together to really serve those needs for Montana, what's definitely a, a forefront of that, that report. And, and I think uh, we're going to make some headway here that 
will hold up as a, a good example across the country. Thank you. Regent Johnstone. Just one party observation, and I'd make this with respect to, frankly, all four of the reports. That I think it's very important that we drive the agenda on this, that whoever's in charge, but Dr. Lace in your case, um, and we not get bogged down in too much process. These are important. They're needed by the state, um, and we need to drive this forward and be, I guess I, I would encourage us to be more aggressive rather than less aggressive in moving this forward. With that, shall we send our thanks to Dr. Lacey for a good report, and, uh, and we'll you. wait to hear from you next meeting. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we have two more agenda items this, uh, this morning for our two-year education, um, and the next one is Healthcare Montana Grant Progress Report. John, would you like to tee that up for us? Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. It's pretty exciting. One year ago today, we announced that Montana uh, received uh, the $15 million grant from the U.S. Department of Labor titled Healthcare Montana. Missoula College is the uh, lead college uh, for the grant, and it has 18 consortium partners. Um, as we talk about the importance of getting folks together, different agencies, different partners, going on this very minute in Helena is a statewide meeting. Uh, which is being convened through uh, the Healthcare Montana grant that includes industry representatives, uh, statewide staff, health healthcare transformation specialists, workforce coordinators, apprenticeship specialists, job service representatives, and the adult basic education representatives all coming together in Helena to talk about this particular initiative. I'm very, very pleased to introduce uh, also a very familiar face, Dr. Shannon O'Brien, who is the new dean of Missoula College, and uh, she has done an absolutely magnificent job uh, taking the reins of this effort. So, Dr. O'Brien. Thank you, Dr. Sack. Chair Nystoon. Regents, it's great to be here and to report to you the um, ex very exciting progress that we have with this healthcare grant and um, hearing the questions and the conversation previously on um, the Governor's Main Street Montana project. Uh, you know, if, if nothing else, both of these TACT grants that we um, as a state have uh, you know, been been quite honored to receive uh, collaboration and you know the the con the the basic concept of working together, and so that coordination with Main Street Montana, as well as Department of Labor and Industry, as well as industry leaders um, within the the healthcare system, for example, with this um, specific grant, um, is the the primary fundamental purpose. Um, there's in your packets and. And on the screen there, um, the we, we call it Mission Possible, uh, is to transform localized college health care education into a statewide workforce system and to really address the need of creating access to rural education. That's, that's our, our critical opportunity for Montana. Um, we have... Uh, um, um, homegrown solution for Montana's um, health care workforce. Next slide, please. I wanted to just introduce to you, um, we're, we're, we're quite proud of our uh, web uh, presence there, and lots of questions can be asked or answered, um, and more asked as the conversation progresses on that um, website. Um, you can see there's um, training programs for students if they want to, or prospective students, or people who are currently incumbent workers in the workforce who might want to get trained um, in a different area. Um, a list of the participating colleges, an elaborate, um, kind of exhaustive research of um, data collection of what institutions, what units provide which programs throughout the state was put together, um, and then pieces about employer engagement I'm going to talk about in a minute, as well as resources. Next slide. Uh, so the prim primary objectives and the strategies here, the employer engagement, there was a workforce needs assessment that has been put together over 90 uh, clinics, uh, healthcare providers, 
uh, and, and executives from healthcare were, um, were asked questions about their essential workforce needs. And part of that, in, in addition to that information, as well as this rapid response team, we have partners in the field who are, um, who, who are kind of our board members, if you will, that are prepared to um, answer questions within a 24-hour or less period of time. They know they're on the team. And when, for example, our nursing curriculum meetings that happened weekly, uh, um, they would be available to answer questions when something came up with the faculty or other uh, health care providers who might be on that team. So we could really get a deeper look at radiology needs and CT scans, for example. Uh, and then we also have, you know, have, um, it's great to have Dr. Lacey on board here. There's a lot of collaboration there of looking at industry recognized credentials and building a Montana healthcare apprenticeship program that is um, new to the state um, and looking at ways to provide uh, post secondary credits um, for that work as well. Um, as far as the curriculum redesign, in case you uh, um, don't know, there's, there's uh, some sensitivity of, that might be uh, um, found around curriculum redesign, redevelopment, though this is really a phenomenal opportunity to, as you have said, listen to the needs of the workforce and be responsive to those needs. So our um, faculty and staff are stepping way back to truly look at what's needed and how we can efficiently and very effectively make sure that we have people trained in the workforce that can be there. Um, and uh, the plan is, is that you will be introduced to these uh, potential curricular changes in your March meeting is when we hope that you will see those. And we are on schedule for that. Um, we're looking at um, uh, practical nurse. We're essentially, we've, we've heard a lot about the stackable credits concept with the RevUp grant, the TACT uh, 3 grant. With the TACT 4 grant, we're also um, doing the kind of lattice concept. So we're looking at, at a core curricular set for healthcare professions and what are the common courses, whether students want to go into nursing or go into physical therapy eventually, or if they want to go into respiratory care, there might be a core STEM-based curricula that they need to look at taking, and then um, they can move over if they want to shift their um, professional direction but stay in the healthcare field. Uh, and then, uh, and, and then, our student success is a is a strong component, as it is with the Rev Up grant. You'll hear. I'm actually delighted to be going after Mr. Springer because he's a phenomenally articulate human being and engaging. Um, so we have career coaches, very similar to what you've seen in the TACT uh, three grant and the Rev Up grant. Um, online tutoring, 24 hours, uh, and Ed Ready. You've heard quite a bit about as part of this as well, and then. And we are piggybacking on the prior learning assessments um, that, that is uh, critical for the kind of efficiency that you may see. I will leave it there. And that is the end of my report and I stand for questions. Thank you, Dean. Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner Sec, do you have any yes, sir, additional uh, comments? <clears throat> Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, I'd just like to uh, mention that last Friday, in Missoula, um, the Healthcare Montana grant convened faculty from across the state. In fact, they had uh, close to 100 folks present who were taking a look at that lattice approach that uh, Dean O'Brien mentioned uh, from a, cross, a broad suite of uh, healthcare uh, programs at the two year colleges as well as nursing. I had the opportunity to, to attend uh, the afternoon portion of it, and it was was very well done, so I just wanted to mention that. Let's have some questions and comments from the rest of the board. I, I, excuse me. I, I just had one. When, when will we start seeing students join the, the courses? The goal would be a, a year from now. So fall of 
16. That is that is correct. Regent Johnson. Thank you. Other questions? If not, we thank you, Dean O'Brien, for your great report and good work. Okay, our final uh, item of business today in the two-year in education uh, committee has to do with Rev Up uh, Montana Grant Progress Report, uh, Deputy Commissioner Sec. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Two years ago at this meeting, we announced that Montana received $25 million from the Department of Labor uh, for the Rev Up Grant, which is, as you may recall, is focused on advanced manufacturing and energy workforce development skills. Great Falls College MSU is the lead college, and we have 13 colleges plus the Montana Department of Labor and Industry, which are a part of this consortium. Um, I would like to say that I've been so impressed with the leadership of Dean Susan Wolf and her team at Great Falls College and with uh, Matt Springer, who has been the uh, project director from the beginning. Um, I think, I believe they, working with the uh, consortium campuses, have done a magnificent job, and I'm very pleased to welcome Director Springer to the podium. Thank you, John, and uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, as, as John mentioned, uh, it was two years ago that we, we came, and uh, we're able to announce that, that we had been successful in, uh, in obtaining a $25 million award. Then Josh Regalo uh, encouraged us to put some paint on the barn. While that money was nice, uh, you know, let's get after it. Let's go get some things done. So I'm here today to tell you a little bit about some of the uh, impacts we've been able to achieve to date. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on, on four areas. Um, but I'll give you a quick reminder just about the project. We're essentially Shannon's project, but for welding. <coughs> Um, so $25 million project, we have 13 colleges involved and then the Department of Labor has a major partner. Uh, we're targeting low-skilled adult populations uh, and focused on nine trades-oriented occupations. Uh, that has allowed us to improve and enhance a lot of individual programs at individual colleges. In addition, TAC funds are really focused on helping systemic reforms uh, occur across the system. And I'll focus a little bit on those today. Really, those are focused on two main issues. One is trying to close the skills gap, and secondly, improve return on investment for students. I'll talk a little bit about the, the shifts we've made in programming um, to try to shift the needle on those issues. Um, I'm going to start with programs and, and then highlight three more areas for you as well. Um, Essentially what we've done is taken existing CAS and AAS programs and split those up into semester length tiers. Most colleges now are, are providing a certificate of technical studies to students that complete at least one semester. Um, therefore students that, that have to leave, life happens. It's, it's the majority of our students at two-year colleges that leave before obtaining a degree. Uh, they have something to go into the labor market with, an educational credential that they can, uh, that they can shop around. In addition, we've embedded industry-recognized credentials in 40 academic programs. Those are things like the National Institute of Metalworking Skills credentials. Students ob obtain those as they matriculate through a program. So again, if life happens, they have to leave before completing their degree. That is something else that they have to, uh, to run through the labor market as well. It's a little bit of a safety net. Uh, in addition, we've aligned the learning outcomes across all of the colleges. So in essence, a student that, that obtains a welding degree from Missoula College uh, ostensibly has the same skills as one that, that got that training at Dawson Community College as well. That should aid in student transfer and also allow some efficiency for students that want to specialize in a program that may only one, on, maybe only one campus has, allows them to uh, partake in, in a good amount of training at their native institution before transferring. Uh, to date, we've served about 3,000 students. Uh, I'll break that number down for you a little bit. That's uh, about 1,300 students, 1,308, that the Department of Labor will count as participants. Uh, 842 unique students that we've served through coaching, which is a proactive or an intrusive advising strategy. And then about 807 that we've served through changes made to developmental math programs at, at other institutions. Our goal um, is, is 3,400, right around 3,400. Um, and that's a combination of those first two numbers. So uh, the participants plus, the, plus a coach number. Um, to date, we've served uh, 2,150 uh, of those students, which is about 63% of the way to our goal. We're about 40% of the way through our enrollment period. 
Um, so feel pretty good about that. Moving on to, a, to another best practice that's, that's kind of arisen in the project. Uh, we were able to hire 14 workforce navigators um, and put one in place at each of the institutions uh, that are involved in our consortium. Those workforce navigators are college employees, but they spend significant time at the job service. They kind of fit in that zipper, if you will, serving both, uh, both institutions. We've charged them with recruiting, retaining, and placing students uh, in the RevUp programs. And I'll talk about their impacts in each one of those areas a little bit. This data is still, is still fresh, and this is just kind of what we've been able to put together to date. Um, further evaluation will take place, and these numbers will become more secure. But uh, as I said, the, the navigators spend time at job service, really focused on serving unemployed, underemployed, TA eligible, uh, anyone that's looking for a better job, really. Um, what they've been able to do is rather than just refer uh, those people to college programs, they say, meet me at the college tomorrow. We'll walk through the enrollment process. The navigators share that they think out of 100 referrals, probably 80 of them would get lost and not enroll in the progress in, the, in our programs, and that they've been really uh, helpful in providing extra supports and getting people into that enrollment um, period. We think the impacts of that are, on average, are, are around $120,000 uh, per institution per year in terms of recruitment. That wouldn't, um, that wouldn't have resulted in FTE, tuition and fees, uh, and, and so forth. So it, it seems like the ROI um, for those positions, just based on their impacts on recruitment, uh, is, looking, is looking very strong. The navigators also case manage students, meaning they contact them regularly. Again, it's an intrusive or proactive advising strategy. Our expectation would be that that probably increases retention rates about 10%. That will be on the high end, but. Um, but similar to what we see in, in, in similar strategies kind of across the nation. Uh, in terms of placement, we're also seeing very strong impacts uh, with many programs reporting 80%, 100% in some cases, um, placement rates out of our programs. Uh, Dr. Lacey did a great job talking about our alignment uh, with Montana Department of Labor Industry, also the governor's office. Um, I, I would further emphasize the one of the, the items that will be happening at the State Workforce Investment Board meeting tomorrow is a discussion about how to institutionalize a relationship between the KINs, uh, sector partnerships, which have been catalyzed through our project, um, and, and perhaps the State Workforce Investment Board as well, uh, to try to cement those uh, relationships and those efforts uh, in coordination with one another and ensuring that we're not duplicating outreach to our business partners as well. Um, one thing I would, I would mention uh, as, uh, about the workforce navigators as well, key to their placement has been outreach to businesses. And I, I asked them all to give me a, a number in terms of meaningful uh, contacts they've made with businesses, um, in, in terms of businesses looking at those two-year institutions as an asset uh, for finding workforce. And uh, they reported to me that, that we, at this point, have uh, been involved with 286 businesses in meaningful relationships. Really what we wanted to see happen is that HR directors are calling those navigators and saying, I need four people by spring you know, at this level of training. And uh, across the board, they've reported that that relationship has started to occur. So, Dr. Lacey covered the rest of this. <laughs> um, so in terms of one big shift that's happened in the program, you may recall two years ago, the state was at about 9% unemployment. Um, you know, we're roughly at full employment now. In addition to that, we are anticipating uh, roughly 25% of the existing workforce will retire in the next three to five years. Uh, when we look at the number of young people that we have to fill that void, there isn't enough to begin with. I'm neither an economist nor a mathematician, but my own calculation um, would suggest that if we see the same number of students continue into higher education that traditionally have, that workforce gap is probably 60 to 70,000 individuals. If we're looking at that, we can't just continue to focus on pre-employment training in the ways that we traditionally have, but have to also look at how do we make our existing workers more productive, and how can we create, begin to create a system um, that helps our businesses upskill existing workers as well, allowing them to be more productive. So in that vein, that's, that's been a big shift in terms of the circumstances um, that we've been looking at with the grant. Um, the main activity we've, we've taken to date kind of in that vein is to uh, hire a vendor to look at the skills gaps and the training gaps that we may have in the state uh, and also ask them to, to help us devise uh, perhaps a model that would allow us to 
kind of create that system using existing resources in the, in the collaborative uh, model that, that Dr. Lacey spoke of as well. So in, in the end, what we'd like to see is, uh, is not just changes to programs, but also systemic shifts that would uh, result in a, in a more sustained, flexible, efficient, responsive, and unified workforce development system. And with that, I'm probably out of adjectives. So I'll turn it back over. Thank you, Director Springer. John, uh, Deputy Commissioner John Sack, what would you add to that? I, I would just like to uh, just give a shout out to uh, Mr. Springer for the incredible work that he's been doing. This is, this is hard work. This is, this is change at, at its greatest level. And uh, that said, I would like to uh, thank each of the campuses who are uh, partners with this grant because they are a part of that change process. And uh, so I'm, I'm very impressed with what's happened over the last two years. Questions and comments from the regents? I, I am interested in things other than workforce development, so can I? <laughs> I I'm, uh, I heard that. Uh, I'm curious, what happens to this when the grant is expended? And where are we on the? on that process, and then uh, will we be able to continue to do these things when we <coughs> spent the grant or not? Sure, uh, thank you for the question. Um, in, so in terms of where we are with the project, we're, we're right at about the two-year mark. Uh, so October 1 will be, will be year, two, year three, the beginning of year three. Um, we had a little bit of a slip. You may remember October 1 of 13, the government shut down, and we, we, <coughs> we had a bit of a break there. Um, so we have one more year of programming, and then we have a year of evaluation. And that year of evaluation should help answer a lot of the questions in terms of whether, you know, what have been the impacts and, and what seem to be the, the practices that we should retain. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of programming, uh, those, those shifts have been, you know, are very uh, sustainable in, in terms of their ingrained in programs. The fee structures, you know, should be in place to support, uh, support that as well. Um, in terms of some of these systemic efforts and, and the zippering, um, my, my hope and, and intention would be to strengthen and institutionalize those connections as much as we can um, before the end of the grant period. I think the navigators are, are a strategy that, that would fall naturally into helping bridge the two institutions. Uh, I think if we look at a, a collaborative post-employment training system, that's also something that um, services both agencies well and, and could help cement those relationships. Um, so those are, I guess that's kind of the direction that we're going. Um, and I think if we can be effective in, in finding uh, some ways to institutionalize those relationships will, will be affected. Thank you. I, I Just an observation, I don't know whether anybody else saw it, but I think the CEO of Volkswagen two days ago embraced the idea of a million immigrants from Syria precisely to address the problem that Germany has, that they don't have enough young people coming up to be trained. So, interesting. Other questions or comments? Any questions or comments for Director Springer? If not, we say thank you for that. Is there any other final discussion on the two-year? Deputy Commissioner Sack. Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, um, I would like to uh, recognize the uh, great work of uh, one of the members of the Commissioner's Office, uh, Ms. Sue Jones, uh, on September 14th was uh, recognized uh, uh, by the governor and, and along with other state employees uh, for the governor's uh, excellence award. So uh, Sue, uh, thank you for all you've done for two-year education in Montana. Congratulations. Other, uh, anything else today? If not, Chairman Tuss, I think we're 15 seconds over our allotted time for the agenda, and I return it back to Nicely you. Nicely done. Nicely done. Thank you, uh, Regent Nystum. Um, at, at this point, we're, we're nearly at the point where we're going to break for lunch, um, but as we typically do at the beginning of the first day of our two-day meeting, um, I would like to ask the campuses if there are any introductions new staff members or members of their executive team that they would like to make at this particular point. I think I saw a nod from President Cruzado. Yes, absolutely. Mr. Chair, members of the board, um, I am very, very excited to introduce to you a person that you will have an opportunity to see and share with over the next um, year. 
Uh, as you know, the American Council on uh, Education has the most prestigious leadership um, program, which it's aimed to build the next generation of academic leaders for America. Um, two years ago, Montana State University had Paul Gore uh, as its fellow. Today, he, he's a provost at a Catholic university. And it is with great pleasure uh, for me to um, this morning to introduce Dr. Maureen McCarthy. Dr. McCarthy is a faculty member at Kennesaw State um, University in the Department of Psychology. She's also the third uh, faculty executive assistant to the president, an internal leadership development program that they have at that university. Importantly for our uh, conversations with the board, um, she is an expert in uh, education, uh, curriculum, and pedagogy, and one of her most recent publications is titled Using Quality Benchmarks for Assessing and Development Undergraduate Programs, which is something that we have been focused on. This is a great experience. One of the things that we do is that we, we will be sending Maureen out to each of our campuses and uh, I also need for you to know that I reach out always to my counterpart in Missoula to see if these fellows can help, can spend the day um, with the president and, and their cabinet. So in a way, this is a two-way street. Not only these individuals come to Montana to learn about the way in which we're conducting uh, our agenda for higher education, but we also have a lot to uh, learn from. So with that, I just need to introduce Dr. McCarthy and welcome her. Welcome, Dr. McCarthy. We're glad that you're with us. Um, President Engstrom. Chair Tusk, members of the board, uh, I uh, would like to follow on in that notion of leadership. Uh, when I became president, we established uh, what we call the Presidential Leadership Fellow on campus. And we look each year for a, a faculty or staff member to engage with us for a year as a Presidential Fellow. And um, so you have seen some of those uh, over the past uh, three years uh, as they participated in that program. And so this year, uh, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Dina Mansour. Uh, Dina, would you stand, please? Dina is the associate director <clears throat> of our Mike and Maureen Mansfield Center on campus. And some of you remember the presentation last year on the Mansfield Center. Uh, well, uh, Dina is the associate director, and she has uh, perhaps the most stellar uh, grant writing record that I've ever heard of. She, she is like 99% effective at writing grants to the point where um, because of her efforts, uh, the University of Montana has the largest set of State Department projects at any university in the country. Uh, so it's pretty impressive. So this Leadership Fellows Program has two components, a professional development part for the fellow, and so that involves uh, becoming a member of the cabinet for the year, uh, attending regents meetings, and, uh, and, and again, uh, transferring back and forth to see other campuses, including MSU. The second part of the project, or the second part of the program is a project that the fellow shepherds through, and so previous fellows have each had their own project. Dina uh, was very effective in bringing to my attention the need for uh, developing women in leadership positions. And so two weeks ago, we launched the Women's Leadership Initiative at the University of Montana to uh, help uh, females among our faculty and staff do their own professional development to make them more competitive for leadership positions either on our campus or, or elsewhere. And so Dina is uh, coordinating that Women's Leadership Initiative on our campus. and. Uh, my dad, uh, I'm sure that we will be inviting you to our campus to talk to the cohort of uh, 12 women that will be involved. So Dina, uh, thank you for being here. Would you join me in welcoming Dina as our leadership fellow? And I would like, like to ask uh, Dean Bingham uh, to make an announcement, please. Regents, I'm, I'm glad to uh, welcome to our campus Chad Hickok, who is our Associate Dean of Academics, and he comes to us from Seattle, uh, or the West, actually. And uh, we're grateful to have him here, and uh, um, 
I think you're going to see a lot of him or hear quite a bit from him in the near future. And Thank Chancellor Weatherby. Thank you. Chair Tuss, mem members of the board, I'm very pleased to introduce our interim provost at the University of Montana Western. Uh, many of you around the system are very familiar with Dr. Sylvia Moore. Sylvia, would you stand? She is intimately familiar with the policies and procedures of the system, having been the Deputy Commissioner for Academics and Research for four years. And uh, it's just fabulous to have her on the campus to help us move things forward with her skills, talent, and knowledge. Uh, she has a great sense of humor, always a help on a campus. And she is a nutritionist by discipline, so we do kind of feel that she's watching what we're eating, which can't be a bad thing. So thank you for joining us, Sylvia. President Cruzado. Yes, and um, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Chancellor Nuke also has an announcement. I have uh, two people I'd like to introduce to you. It's not often that we get scooped by the papers, but if you picked up today's Montana standard on the front page above the fold is the introduction of our new provost, Bob Hoare. Bob. Bob is a Butte kid, so it's really great to be able to introduce him here in his own hometown. He's also a Montana Tech uh, alum. He received a degree in, first in computer science from Tech, and then the next year stayed on to get one in mathematics. Then went on to Montana State University to get a PhD in mathematics before going to Wisconsin, UW-La Crosse. Uh, but we're very happy to have him back in uh, the Treasure State and uh, working for us at MSU Billing. So welcome, Bob. <laughs> I'd also like to introduce uh, our new Dean of City College, Dr. Cliff Coppersmith. Cliff? Cliff comes to us most recently uh, as a dean at Penn College of Technology in Pennsylvania. Um, he has four degrees, starting with a community college degree at Jamestown College in New York, a bachelor's degree from BYU, master's degree at St. Bonaventure, and then his PhD in, in history and anthropology from Oklahoma State. Uh, we're excited to have him here and, and leading City College for us, so thanks. Chancellor Nook, that's called being scooped if you're front page above the fold. <laughs> President Cruzado. And last but not least, even though she's not here today because she's working hard back in campus, uh, we have a new legal counsel at Montana State University. You might remember that for 27 years we were uh, blessed with having Leslie Taylor, uh, an extraordinary uh, individual. Then last year we conducted a search. I want to thank Viv Hamill for helping us in that search committee. And we were able to identify Kelly Peterson. And Kelly is absolutely fantastic, also a native of Butte. Um, she has a graduate, an undergraduate uh, degree from Gonzaga University and let the record show that she completed her law degree from University of Montana. And I am delighted with her. <laughs> Additional announcements, please. Mr. Chair, members of the board, for the record, I'm Stacy Klippenstein. I'm the president at Miles Community College, and it's with great pleasure first to introduce, we have our board chair, Mr. Uh, Jeff Okerman is here, and if you have any questions for him, but I'll ask him to stand. That's Mr. Okerman um, is here. And as well as I want to introduce, um, she'll be here tomorrow. She's at meetings today, but uh, uh, Dr. Rita Kratke is our new Dean of Workforce Development and Community Outreach, and many of you know her from her time at MSU Bellings, and she is now at Miles Community College and we're really extremely excited to have her with us, as well as we have our new Vice President for Administrative Services. Um, some of you may know her from her long stint in the legislative audit and fiscal divisions, as well as with the Montana Supreme Court. Most recently, she has been the Powell County uh, Treasurer, um, and now she came over to Miles uh, Community College to be with us, but it's Miss Lisa Smith. Thank you.
many introductions today. Any additional introductions that we missed? Okay. Thank you very much. We are now going to break for lunch, and we will be coming back uh, at 1.15. The Board of Regents, we will be meeting in executive session in the Mountain Con Room. Okay? So I'll see you back here at 1.15.